Aloha mai kako. Good morning. This is the June 25th continuation of the June 24th through 25th, 2020 Land Use Commission meeting. And it's being held by interactive conference technology linking video conference participants and other interested individuals of the public via a Zoom internet conferencing program in order to comply with state and county official operational directives during the current pandemic. Members of the public are viewing the meeting either via the Zoom webinar platform or via the YouTube streaming video that's linked to this meeting. For all meeting participants, please be aware that unlike in in-person meetings where our court reporter can easily state that she cannot hear or ask for a repeat, in these meetings she's unable to at times or times difficult for her to do this. So I'd like to stress for everyone the importance of speaking slowly, clearly, directly into your microphone, and also before speaking, please state your name for the record. Please also be aware for all meeting participants that this is being recorded on the digital record of the Zoom meeting as well as on YouTube, and your continued participation as your implied consent to be part of the public record for this event. If you do not wish to be part of this record, you should leave the meeting now. This Zoom conferencing technology allows the parties for each docket item and each participating commissioner individual remote access to the meeting proceedings via their personal digital devices. Myself, Jonathan Scheuer, the LUC Chair, Commissioners Axon, Chang, Okuda, and Wong, LUC Executive Officer Daniel Ordenker, LUC Chief Planner Scott Derrickson, our Deputy Attorney General Linda Chow, and the Court Reporter Jean McManus are all on Oahu. Commissioner Cabral is on Hawaii Island, Commissioner Ohigashi is on Maui, Commissioner Giovanni from Kauai is excused for this meeting. We currently have eight seated commissioners, of which seven are participating in this meeting. For all the dockets for today, I'm going to um, briefly run over our procedures. If there's anybody who's desired to give public testimony on these matters, I will ask them, I will admit them into the meeting room. I will ask them to identify themselves with the, or the person or the organization that's been given testimony. Um, I will swear them in. I will offer them two minutes to give their testimony, at which time the commissioners and the parties for that docket may ask questions of them. And then they will be moved from the virtual witness box back in to, attend, to becoming an attendee. After all registered testifiers complete their testimonies um, and general audience members complete their testimonies. I will give up parties the opportunity to admit exhibits into the record. And after the admission of exhibits, the petitioner in each will present their participating right now for our procedures for today. Seeing none. Our next agenda item is a status report on docket number A99729, the Newton Family Limited Partnership, now known as the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust. Will the parties for docket number A99729 Jonathan, this is Jean. I'm not hearing you right now. Okay. At which point did you stop hearing me? Um, hold on. Um, you, I got as far as the Hawaii Islands Land Trust parties for docket number, and that's as far as I heard you. Well, the party for docket number eight. No, I'm sorry. I'm still having trouble hearing you. Yeah, and this is Nancy. It's blocked too. I, I just have a frozen screen of your face and I stopped hearing you at the same time. One minute, one minute recess, please.
we are back on the record. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I, I have no idea what happened. I apologize. In any case, Ms. Kalkua, can you please identify yourself for the record? Aloha everyone, this is Laura Ka'akua from Hawaiian Islands Land Trust. Okay. Because I also serve on the board of the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust, I will recuse myself from this item. I will leave the meeting and ask to be readmitted when we move on to the next item and I will have to hand the chairing of this meeting over to the first vice chair, Nancy Cabral. Okay, well, thank you for the surprise. Okay, um, I have basic paperwork here, but I um, apologize for not having all of the details. So, um, Laura Ka Kakua is going to be our testifier at this point. Is that my understanding? Yes, and um, Vice Chair, I just have a a relatively short status update to share with the commission. Okay. Um, and I do have a, a, a short, only five slide um, PowerPoint presentation to, to help share that update if it is um, possible to share screen, possible and appropriate to share screen. Okay, and all of the parties of, that are present have already been introduced. I missed, missed some of that with all of the logging in details. So if you're, if that's acceptable. Um... Uh, chair? Yes. Uh, this is Commissioner Wong. Yes, Commissioner Wong, I see you now. Hi. Uh, <laughs> did you go over the uh, record and a reminder for the public about this is just a, you know, um, update? Let me see what I, you know, I had this information <laughs> printed about two seconds ago. Okay. Um, Nancy, Nancy, this is Jean. Yes. Yeah, I have not gotten appearances of the parties. Okay. Record. And that's what I don't think I have either. All I have is the opening, the chair's opening statement, which I think um, Commissioner Schroyer just read. Digital. It talks about digital. This is all operational. Um, so I think that's where we have to be. We have to introduce all of the parties. So, um, correct. Um, we have our land use commission members present that I see on the screen are Commissioner Chang. Commissioner Axon, Commissioner Ohigashi, Commissioner Okuda, and staff, um, Commissioner Wong. And then I have our Executive Director, Oren Decker. And then um, uh, Ms. Apuna, um, is there, you're here, I see you're here. Do you have anyone else that's present with you that we would want to notify us as being present? No, Vice Chair, it's just me. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then Hawaii, uh, then I, Derek Simon, you are here representing what parties? Uh, uh, Chair Cabral, I'm, I'm on the next agenda item. I'm not sure if, if the commission prefer that I mute my video at this time, but I'm, I'm a panelist on the next uh, docket item. Okay, well, help me there. The next one being the... Um, Madam Chair, could we take a two minute recess. That would be an excellent idea. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, thank you. So we just have our commissioners here. My apologies. I will
muted. I thought I'm unmuted. Can you guys hear me or not? Okay. Okay. So if um, Commissioner Wong's re ready to take over then if the staff can bring everybody else in. I see Hawaii County staff are still on board, it looks like. But okay, I'm ready to release if, uh, and we can move forward. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Arnold, are you okay to go move ahead? Can oh, you hear me? Lee, please, Lee uh, is on. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've got. Can you put it back on? We good. Okay. Can you put it as regular square, so I can see everyone? Okay. Okay. Uh, whenever you're ready, Nancy. Yeah, I'm ready. You can go ahead and take take it on and expedite things. My apologies for not going ahead of time and being prepared. Uh, Nancy, do you want to appoint me? Yes, I'd like to appoint you as the um, chair for this docket. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is Commissioner Wong speaking. Um, I'm going to start from the beginning just to make sure we have everything on the record. The next agenda item is status report on docket number A99-729, Newton Family Limited Partnership known as Hawaiian Island Land Trust. Um, will the party for docket number A99-729 please identify themselves for the record. You may need to um, enable your audio and once I acknowledge you, please mute yourself back on, uh, back. Thank you. Uh, Laura. Uh, Aloha, Commissioner Wong and commissioners. This is Laura Ka'akua. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Hawaiian Islands Land Trust. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else? Okay, if not, let me update the record. On May 7, 2019, the Commission met using interactive conferencing technology for status report on docket number A99-729 Newton Family Limited Partnership, known as Hawaiian Island Land Trust. From May 15, 2019, the Commission received a copy of correspondence from County of Hawaii to Hawaiian Island Land Trust regarding a change of zone ordinance. On June 17, 2020, the Commission mailed the June 24th and 25th, 2020 Notice of Agenda to the parties to the statewide Oahu and Hawaii regular and email mailing lists. For the members of the public, please be reminded that the commission will not be considering the merits of the A99-729 Newton Family Limited Partnership petition. Rather, the commission is interested in learning about the current state of activities related to this docket, including compliance with conditions. I will now recognize the written uh, public testimony submitted in this matter, identifying the person or organization submitting the testimony. Uh, is there any? Okay, so I was informed by staff that there is no public testimony on this agenda item. Okay, uh, next I will be calling on any individuals who have registered to provide virtual testimony on this agenda item. I'll ask them to raise their hand using the Zoom feature, and then I'll acknowledge them, bring them in, swear them in, and then let them testify, and then we'll see if, that, if there's any questions, we'll allow them, and then after that, we'll send them back out, okay? Uh, and I'll see we have one individual, uh, Mr. Ken Church, who has raised their hand. Okay. Yeah. Hey, can we please let Mr. Church in? Church is going to be in as a panelist. Yeah. I'm just talking. I don't think he understands what's going on. Then let, let, let me ask you the questions first. Unmute. Oh, un I'm just starting to. Is Mr. Hello? Church. Hi, Mr. Church. 
Yes, uh, the link that I was given put me in the audience. Yes. Uh, panel. This is for the Newton Land Trusts. Are you interested in testifying on this item? No, I just wanted to be sure that when mine came up, I was in the panel. Yes, you will be brought up when your um, docket is heard. So um, we're just holding right now for anyone who wants to um, do any testimony on the Newton Land Trust. So we'll put you back into the waiting room. Is that okay, Mr. Church? Great. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome, sir. Okay. Is there anyone else who really, uh, want to testify on this issue? Please raise your hand now. One. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, seeing none, public testimony is closed. Okay. Now, let's go to the next part. Um, counting OP, counting OP has witnesses, no one? Okay, okay, let's start up. Uh, Hawaii, the next uh, was the call for a status report from the new owner, Hawaiian Island Land Trust, Ms. Ka'akua, will you please present your status report? Uh, please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, would it be okay to share a um, short PowerPoint presentation to help with the, the visuals for a status report? Sure. Uh, you going to do the share screen? Um, yes, I can do that. I'll, I'll bring it up in just a second. Um, and just by, by way of introduction, um, since it's been a year since I've been before you all, um, the Newton Family Partnership donated uh, this Kukuau Forest property to Hawaiian Islands Land Trust. And Hawaiian Islands Land Trust is Hawaii's statewide land trust. That's both a Hawaii 501c3 nonprofit as well as a nationally accredited land trust. And our uh, mission is to protect and steward lands that sustain Hawaii and to perpetuate Hawaiian values by connecting people back to Aina. And so, um, over the years, we've protected over 21,000 acres, and um, that's in six preserves, which we own and steward, along with the communities surrounding those preserves, as well as in 52 conservation easements that we hold over private lands to protect conservation values on those lands. And uh, this Kukuau Forest property, um, We've had much discussion with our board of directors and staff about this forest and have um, taken the year to learn about the forest, its health, threats to the, the native species and um, what the community of Hilo would like to see. And um, I'll, I'll go into uh, this short presentation now if I can um, share screen. Are you able to see this okay? Mm, yeah. Do uh, you, you want to make the whole screen if possible, please? Okay. Okay. Um, so this is just our status update on Kukuau Forest. Kukuau is the name of the Ahupua'a, which this property is in. Um, this is the large parcel, um, which is in large part native forest. And you can see the split here between land use designations with the Makai portion being an agricultural designation and the Malka portion being in conservation designation. Um, my understanding is that the Newton family um, had plans for some development on the property and conditions were put on that would be appropriate for um, uh, a development scenario. And so once this land was donated to Hawaiian Islands Land Trust, um, we have a very different mission, which is to protect and steward the lands that sustain us um, with a special focus on cultural lands, um, 
native ecosystems um, and lands that sustain our islands. So um, we had to understand what was here before we could understand how to best steward it. Um, so this is a, an image that shows the um, different species within, within this property. And so um, there are ohia and koa, which are really the pillars of the native forest throughout the property. Um, but there are non-native species um, encroaching on the property on both sides, both the Makai um, section closest to residential development, as well as the um, Mauka side of the property. And so um, some of this can be seen um, just by looking at the aerial imagery, the bright green um, spots are typically uluhe patches, which are kind of form this mat of native ferns. Um, and then you see koa and ohia stands and um, strawberry guava and um, clydemia and other pretty nasty invasive species um, encroaching in from both sides. And so um, we know that if we do not actively manage this forested property, the invasive species will continue to um, expand their territory and push the native koa, uluhe, um, ohia, um, and other native species out. And so from our experience in, in land stewardship, we really need to actively manage the property in order to um, care for it appropriately. And this is a, an image showing the different um, rain levels. Um, and so the back section of this property really does get a, a huge amount of rain. And the, even the Mackay section of the property um, has a lot of rain as well. And so we, we want to keep um, as much of that rain as we can on this land um, and not have it, you know, run ferociously down through Hilo. Um, and we know that with the native ground cover and the native forest, that is really what, what um, serves to retain water. Uh, whereas when we have stands of strawberry guava and clydemia there, um, also coming with that is the invasive pig ungulates. And so over time, if this property isn't managed actively, um, those species will creep in and more sediment runoff will happen because there's going to be more areas of land exposed. And uh, with the heavy rains in this area, it will wash down into the residential community and, and through the water system eventually out to the ocean. Um, and so our, I'm just going to stop, our, I'm going to stop my share here. Um, but our work thus far has been to understand the landscape that we've um, inherited through a donation from the Newton family. And at this point, it's, um, it wouldn't be enough to just say that the land is protected and um, kind of call it a conservation win and um, revert the land back to conservation designation because um, forest management activities within the conservation district generally require a permit from the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the permit usually triggers the need for an environmental assessment or even an environmental impact statement and both of those processes would negate our ability to manage this area in the short term. Um, and so our, what we want to do is um, try to take action to start management of the forest to prevent the fast spread of strawberry guava on the Makai section as soon as possible. Um, and so the agricultural designation um, though originally intended to assist in a family development plan, it actually really helps us to achieve um, 
true conservation that benefits the native forest because it gives us flexibility to um, work within that landscape. So um, what we're preparing for now is a um, request to amend land use conditions and our uh, plans are to be before you again in August with that um, actual request. Okay, thank you. Um, is that it? That's all. Okay. <laughs> Mahalo. <laughs> thank you. Uh, County, do you have any questions? Uh, you got to unmute yourself, County. And please identify yourself. Yes, please. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Now, okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, this is Diana Mellon Lacey, um, Deputy Corporation Counsel. Uh, with me is Deputy Corporation Counsel John Mukai and April Supernot from the uh, Planning Department. Uh, and at this time, I don't believe we have any comments, correct? No. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. You can mute yourself again. Uh, OP, uh, do you have any questions? Oh, also, please uh, identify yourself. Uh, this is Donna Puna, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, are there any questions? Uh, Commissioner Okuda has raised her hands. Commissioner, you can, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kaokua. Uh, just a background question. Is the Hawaii, Hawaiian Island Land Trust the only accredited land trust operating in the state of Hawaii? No, we are not. So um, there are, uh, there, maybe more but to my understanding there's two national land trusts so uh, the trust for public land is a national land trust that does operate within hawaii and they're accredited and the nature conservancy which is a another um, national land trust that operates within hawaii i believe the nature conservancy is also accredited though i'm not positive on that um, but i believe we are the only nationally accredited Hawaii nonprofit um, land trust. And under the statute, only an accredited land trust may hold a conservation easement, uh, which is provided by statute. Is my understanding correct? Um, I don't think that it's a requirement under um, Hawaii statutes that the land trusts actually be nationally accredited. So there are land trusts in Hawaii um, that hold uh, conservation easements that are not accredited land trusts. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll just, you know, of course, we would make whatever uh, decision on any future filings based on the evidence that's presented at that point in time. But uh, without prejudging anything, I think your uh, method of doing conservation using uh, the existing agricultural designation to avoid unnecessary steps and unnecessary costs, it, it seems to me on its face a very, very smart uh, way of approaching it. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kuda. Commissioner Kuda, could you uh, lower your hand, please? Thank you. Commissioner Chang. Yeah. No, it's more of a comment, Laura. I greatly appreciate the work that the, um, the Hoi Lands Trust, you put into it over the last year to understand this land and give us an idea of its condition and how you are preparing to steward it. So thank you so much for the timely report. And I look forward to having you come back in August with some um, condition recommendations. So thank you so much. Mahalo. Thank you, Commissioner Chang. Uh, is there any other commissioners that want to ask a question? OK. 
Okay. If not, I thank you for your status report. Uh, it was a great status report, and we hope to see you soon to update what it, this docket. And thank you again. And we're going to take a brief recess to let the chair back in. So we're in recess. Hi, Laura. Thank you. you. You can log out now unless you want to watch us. <laughs>
because audio has frozen. Everybody's audio has frozen. Okay, let me update the record. Can people hear me? Okay. On August 29th, 2019, the commission met using interactive conferencing technology for an action meeting on this docket to consider the petitioner's motion for issuance of an anticipated negative declaration or anticipated finding of no significant impact or FONSI. On October 11th, 2019, the commission mailed a letter to the Office of Environmental Quality Control transmitting the determination of an anticipated finding of no significant impact, as well as the petitioner's draft EA for publication and the public comment period. On December 16, 2019, the commission received OP's comments on the DEA and FONSI. On June 17th of 2020, the commission mailed the June 24th and 25th notice of agenda to the parties and to the statewide Oahu and Hawaii regular and email mailing lists. On May 27th, prior to the agenda being sent, the commission received the petitioner's motion for issuance of a negative declaration or finding of no significant impact, a memorandum in support of the motion, as well as exhibit one. I want to confirm with Mr. Derrickson that no public testimony has been received on this matter. Yes, that's correct, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, commissioners, are there any disclosures on Seeing none. Are there any individuals who are in the office provide public money on this matter who have not read their hand, raise hand function on I'm losing Zoom. you again, Jonathan. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing you. I got as far as seeing none, are there any individuals who are, are there any I will re repeat. Thank you. Are there any individuals who are attendees in the attendance? Just not getting it. You're frozen. Raise your hand from on Zoom. Not getting that, Jonathan. You froze. Yeah, M Ms. McManus, I hear you. Okay. You know. The meeting is being recorded. We're doing the best that we can. For a third time, in case people did not hear it, is there anybody who is attending this meeting in the attending meeting function who wishes to testify on this matter, use the raise your hand function on Zoom. I do not see anybody raising their hand and no public testimony then will be on this. With that said, Mr. Simon, would you care to make your presentation? Thank you again, Chair, Commissioners. Um, our clients are extremely appreciative of all the efforts that were made to hold these hearings during these um, very unusual times. And I know it takes a lot of time and resources to get everybody um, here on the same page. So we're, we're very appreciative of that. Um, as, as Chair mentioned in his introduction of the docket item, this EA is filed in connection with a pending uh, district boundary petition. Um, because we're reclassifying out of the conservation district, one of the content requirements for that petition is either a finding of no significant impact or an accepted environmental impact statement. Um, this is this is likely the third or fourth iteration that staff has seen of this um, uh, EA, which is including um, preliminary copies that were provided. Um, they were extremely helpful throughout this process, especially Scott Derrickson and Riley Hakoda. So I want to say a special thank you to them. Um, it, it, the, the, the copy of the final EA you have before you uh, shows the revisions that were made in a red line format. 
Um, as you will see, there's very, very minor revisions um, and essentially very few substantive revisions. Um, you know, as a part of the early consultation process, we, we, we reached out to 37 total agencies and parties nine county agencies, 15 plus state agencies, nine of the neighboring landowners, uh, the utility company serving, servicing power and three organizations and, and, and frankly received very minimal comments on, from any of those parties who were also directly notified of the publication of the draft EA. Um, no comments received were, were, were um, particularly negative or, and none contradicted any of the findings in the EA or any of the technical studies that were appended to the EA. Um, as explained in greater detail in, in our past filings on the uh, final EA and, and in the EA itself, you know, this is the, the barriers are seeking to reclassify the Ag District to, to build a farm dwelling um, consistent with surrounding um, neighborhood uh, and, and uses in the area. Um, we, we do believe there is a, a sufficient record for the commission to vote and approve the motion and, and issue the FONSI or finding no significant impact and allow the barriers to proceed with publication of the uh, final EA um, through the environmental bulletin. Um, no threatened or endangered plant or animal species were found on the petition area. There's some common native plants such as nalpaca, most of which will not be disturbed. Um, no archeological resources found within um, the petition area and none have been reported um, nearby. There's been a total of 22 prior surveys in Hawaiian Paradise Park um, for a total of 22 acres, all reported negative findings. Um, there's no anticipated cultural impacts in part from the lack of uh, you know, historical or archeological resources on the petition area. There's currently no public or private access really through the petition area. It's, it's quite overgrown at the moment um, and access will in no way be impeded um, by the project, the shoreline will be uh, remain um, open for use by the public and, and others um, exercising traditional practices, including, um, you know, subsistence sus um, fishing and, and gathering. Um, one issue we we spent extra time addressing was sort of the coastal hazards associated with this part. What well, really associated with developing on the coastline anywhere and, and with a, a, a certain focus on this area of the Big Island. Um, you know, concluded there was really no undue restraints imposed by those conditions um, on the development of the pro project that's been proposed in, in, the, in the EA and in the, the, the petition. And, and there's really no other anticipated impacts, cumulative secondary, um, none to views, water, there'll be slight positive socioeconomic impacts from, you know, just the construction activities that added uh, increase in tax base and um, you know, the addition of a single home is not anticipated to, you know, stress any public utilities or roadways or anything like that. Um, so with that in mind, again, we do believe there's a sufficient record before the commission to vote and approve the issuance of the FONSI and allow for publication of the final EA. And, and I'll leave it at that and, and welcome any questions from the commissioners. Thank you very much, Mr. Simon. Are there questions? The if, if questions, County of Hawaii, please say so, yes or no. Um, yes, we're unsure of the question because it broke up. Does the county have any questions for the petitioner on their presentation? Uh, no, no questions, thank you. Office. No questions. Commissioners, are there questions? If so, raise your hand. Commissioners, no. Okay. Um, are there any comments, just to be sure, any comments in general from the County of Hawaii on this docket?
The county uh, supports the finding of, of the FONSI and feels that it is warranted and uh, given the land use and the surrounding properties. Do the commissioners have any questions for the county? Seeing none. Oh, Commissioner Cabral. Oh, I'm sorry, mine is not a question for the county, but just a comment when you're ready. Okay. We'll go through any questions for the county and then any comments from the Office of Planning. The Office of Planning does not object to petitioner's motion. Okay. That said then, um, Commissioner Cabral, you wanted to make a comment at this time? Um, with that, I am familiar with the general area of this property, not the property or the circumstances personally, but I, would, I don't see any reason for it to not move ahead as requested. Um, I'm not clear why it became conservation land, but I have no problem with it being changed. That's all my comment. Okay. Thank you. So commissioners, and again, I apologize for the unknown cause of audio problems. I will entertain a motion that the LUC accepts or does not accept the final environmental assessment and further authorizes the LUC executive officer to notify the OEQC and the parties that the LUC has accepted or not accepted the FEA. The motion should state the reasons for acceptance or non-acceptance. This is Nancy, and I would make that motion as so eloquently worded, and the reason for the acceptance is that I'm not aware of any problems with this request or any adverse situation that would occur with us proceeding as requested. Chair. Okay. Commissioner Wong. Um, I would like to second Commissioner Cabral's motion, but I would like to add a, just to clarify something, just to make sure that the motion also allows the LUC staff to provide any necessary documents for the filing of the OEQC. Is the move on, Nancy, are you, accept, are you willing to make that change to your motion? Yes, sir. Absolutely would accept that change. Okay. Nancy's uh, motion then. <laughs> okay. Commissioners, we have a motion in front of us for acceptance and the finding of no significant impact on the Barry matter. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Uh, Chair. Commissioner Wong. I wanted to say that um, reviewing the, OE, the, the document itself, it's very well organized um, covering, covering any, if, if there was any potential environmental impacts and proposed mitigation measures. And that this project, um, just the, e, the environmental assessment is to me, you're very well done. So I just, that's why I'm seconding, I mean, I make, I'm supporting this motion. Thank you, Commissioner Wong. Are there any further comments? If there are none, Mr. Ordenker, please roll call the commission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion is to accept the, uh, the, the, the motion to make a finding of no significant impact. Um, Commissioner Cabral. Yes. Commissioner Wong. Yes. Commissioner Axon. Yes. Commissioner Chang. Yes. Commissioner Okuda. Yes. Commissioner Ohigashi. Yes. Commissioner Giovanni is absent. Chair Shoyer. Yes. 
<laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion passes unanimously. Okay. Chair, Chair, if I can make one last comment. Mr. Simon. I, I forgot to do during my intro, but to the extent that Exhibit 1 attached to the motion is not already in the, the record, I ask, just, just ask that it, it be moved into the record. It'll be so ordered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Simon. Thank you all very much. Okay. Commissioners, um, because of the unknown cause of nothing has changed at my house that I know of on my internet connection, but it is clearly unstable. I am thinking what might be in our best service is that if we can quickly move through the next agenda item, the church item, we would then take an early approximately 45 minute break for lunch. I will physically try to relocate to the land use commission office in downtown. And then we would take up the final declaratory ruling order. So if we can get through in the next 15 minutes, we would break at 1015, resume at 11 a.m. Is that acceptable? Okay. We will try that. Right now, we're gonna move on to docket number A18805, Church and Hildall. I need the LUC staff to admit the churches into the meeting room. Uh, they've been promoted to panelist. Thank you. Um, Mr. Church, are you able to turn on your video? I thought it was on. Let me see. Uh, oh, yeah. I have a suggestion for the chair. We have a modem in our house through which our computer goes and our cell phones and everything else seems to use that. And if someone's on a cell phone, they might not be on their computer, but it, it begins to reduce your bandwidth and maybe your problem. Anyway, I'll uh, turn on my video. There we are, and we can now see you. Thank you, Mr. Church. Can you please just once again, identify yourself for the record? You're muted, Mr. Church. I'm Ken Church. Okay. County of Hawaii. Uh, Deputy Corporation Counsel Diana Mellon Lacey, also uh, Deputy Corporation Counsel John Mukai is present, and April Supernot from the Planning Department. Thank you very much. Office of Planning. Good morning, Deputy Attorney General Don Acuna on behalf of the Office of Planning. the record on this docket. On March 28th, 2019, the commission met and determined that the commission should be the accepting authority pursuant to chapter 343 HRS. We denied the petitioner's request to accept an existing environmental assessment and finding of no significant impact. The commission also determined it agreed with the petitioner's draft EA warrants an anticipated finding of no significant impact in support of its petition. On April 9th, 2019, the commission received the petitioner's EA with exhibits one through 24 and a hard copy and CD digital file. On April 26th, the commission of 2019, the commission received the petitioner's correspondence requesting clarification of when the petition was complete and the petitioner's email regarding a need to correct the March 28th, 2019 minutes. On April 30th of 2019, the commission mailed first an order determining whether the Land Use Commission agreed that the petitioner's draft EA warranted an anticipated FONSI, as well as an order determining whether the LUC agreed the petitioner's draft EA warranted a FONSI. And on the same day, the commission mailed a letter to the OEQC regarding the DEA and anticipated FONSI, as well as a notice to 
to the states. On May 3rd, 2019, the commission received the petitioner's correspondence regarding the order caption. On May 29th, 2019, the commission received the petitioner's correspondence regarding county comments on the DEA. On June 18th, 2019, the commission mailed errata caption correction sheets to the parties. On September 10th, 2019, the commission received a motion that the LUC adopt a second order for the issuance of an anticipated negative declaration or anticipated FONSI. On December 10th, 2019, the commission mailed a transmittal letter to the Office of Environmental Quality Control. On January 31st, the commission received OP's comment letter. On March 30th of this year, the commission mailed the LUC meeting agenda to the parties and statewide email Hawaii and Maui mailing lists. And on June 12th, the commission re received from the petitioner of items, one signed paper original of the proposed FONSI, one paper copy of the proposed FONSI, one digital copy of FONSI, A certificate of UC determine issue emanation of a district boundary. On June seventeenth, of agenda to the for statewide Oahu and Hawaii regular and email mailing lists. Mr. Derrickson, has anybody submitted written testimony on this matter? Commissioner Wong. Sure. Um, can I go back to your statements just to make sure it's on the record because you froze? So I, I believe. Um, Please. To the on May 3rd, there's, uh, you stated notice and agenda of the May 7th LUC meeting to the parties statewide and Hawaii mailing list regarding action to correct the March 28th, 2019 minutes. I think uh, we missed that part. Okay. We missed another part uh, uh, when you were talking about on June 12, 2020, the commission received the petitioners. We missed the part, I think that you stated one signed paper original of motion for issuance of FONSI uh, and also the certificate of service. And then the last part I think you stated, I just wanted to reconfirm, is on June 17, 2020, the commission mailed the June 24th, 25th, 2020 notice of agenda to the parties to the statewide Oahu and Hawaii regular and email mailing list. I think that's the only thing that we was kind of scrambled. So, okay, and also um, after we, I would like to state uh, something for the record, Chair, if I may. Oh, no, not for this Please one. proceed. It's the next one. Sorry, Chair. You can keep on going. Okay. Thank you. I was on this stock. Is that correct? Mr. Derrickson. Yes, Chair, staff uh, confirms that there was no written public testimony received for Has any docket. Thank you. Has anyone registered? Not to our knowledge, no. who is meeting as a Zoom attendee who wishes to testify on this docket. If so, raise your hand using the raise your hand. Was that audio received? Uh, please, uh, please restate that again, Chair. Is there anyone who is attending this meeting as a Zoom attendee who wishes to provide testimony? If so, raise your hand using the raise your hand function.
Was that confirming that was heard, Commissioner Wong? Confirmed, Chair. I see nobody has raised their hands. So there will be no public testimony on this docket. Mr. Church, do you care to make your pre any presentation? You are muted, Mr. Church. You are still muted, Mr. Church. How's that? That's, that's better. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have two parts to uh, my opening remarks. The first one is two pages, so, and they're double spaced, so too long. I first want to thank the commissioners for continuing to hear matters regarding our property. We recognize that the commissioners serve the community unpaid and sacrifice a lot of personal and family time in order to serve us. We appreciate. I greatly respect the commitment that you volunteer because I also served as a volunteer board member for a large regional hospital for over 10 years. My wife, Joni, and I purchased our property in 2014. It was a beautiful, gently sloped, grassy, warmer sugarcane field with deep fertile soils. We are a retired couple looking for a meaningful purpose in our retirement years. I grew up on a farm and have always enjoyed the family farm agricultural lifestyle. We believed that we would be able to use the property for agricultural use we knew that it appeared to be zoned conservation, but we also knew that it was prime agricultural land, which had been in sugarcane production since the 1850s. We also knew that agricultural use of the property had continued despite its apparent conservation zoning in the 60s, and that the DLNR's rules had somehow allowed such use without any formal permit issued by the DLNR. We very quickly encountered significant resistance by the DLNR to all of our planned land uses and particularly agricultural uses, and that is why we are here again today. We currently have three unresolved matters before the Commission. Number one, uh, petition A18805, which was submitted um, approximately two years ago. Uh, number two, a proposed FONSI, which appears on today's docket. And number three, a request for a determination by the Commission regarding the correct location of the state land use district boundary in the area of our property. As a preliminary matter, we are aware that normally matters set before the Commission are posted on the LUC's website for public consideration. We have noted that the title of the three matters which I just referred are posted, but only the proposed FONSI's text exists. Neither the original petition nor the request for a boundary interpretation are posted. We had expected that our request for a boundary determination would also be dealt with by the Commission today, and if we find that request result favorable, we believe the proposed FONSI is no longer relevant. Our request that the Commission determine the correct location of the sled boundary in the area of our property is founded in HAR 1515-22F, which states, quote, whenever subsections A, B, C, D, or E cannot resolve an uncertainty concerning the location of any district line, the Commission, upon written application or upon its own motion, shall determine the location of those district lines, end of uh, quote. The text of our request document describes our belief that uncertainty remains. We do accept that the proposed FONSI is in the public record and we are prepared to proceed in that matter also today. Before proceeding with the proposed FONSI, we ask that the Commission issue a final determination regard, regarding our request for a boundary determination, and if not, why not, and when, as this may be the most efficient way to deal with our matters. And that's the end of my opening remark. Thank you, Mr. Church. Are there questions for Mr. Church from the county?
Uh, no questions. Thank you. Um, Office of Planning. No questions. Commissioners. And before there are any questions, I will just mention for everyone's um, information that uh, an employee of Spectrum showed up in my driveway a moment ago and told my wife, oh, by the way, we're doing some work. You might have problems today. So this was the forewarning they gave us. Um, commissioners, do you have questions for Mr. Church? Ms. Cabral. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm getting confused. Um, is Mr. Church asking for action from us different than what was originally on our agenda to take action on is what I'm hearing from him here. I mean, um, so Mr. Church can clarify his request, but I will clarify too that the only items that we can take action on are agendized items. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. That's what I thought. So I'd like to make sure we just focus on information on the agenda items so we can move forward and not, um, though it might be more efficient, expand our um, reach. Thank you. Commissioner Okuda. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is not so much a question, but a comment. If you think comment is not uh, proper at this point in time, I'll withhold the comment. Um, comments might be better made during deliberation if there is a motion. Okay, thank you, Chair. Commissioners, are there any questions for Mr. Church? Seeing none. Will the County of Hawaii please provide their comments on this matter? Uh, the county has no objections to the EA or the FONSI finding. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for the county? Commissioner Okuda? No? Okay. Um, no questions for the county. Ms. Apuna. Office of Planning has no objections to petitioner's motion. Okay. Mr. Church, do you have any final comments or questions? I did ask three questions, at least two questions in that. I asked, well, I'll first say that both the proposed FONSI and the request were submitted in the same package on the same day. And I don't understand why the request also won't be heard. Uh, and in that regard, I also asked why the text of the petition has yet to show up on the LUC's website. It seems to me that if you're inviting public comments on anything regarding that, whether it be the EA or the FONSI, people ought to be able to read the text of the petition, as is the case for the Berries, for example. Uh, their EA hadn't been determined yet, and their FONSI hadn't been determined yet, and their petition showed up. So uh, I don't understand why ours didn't. And also for the, uh, the request, it's, the text is also not up, nor is it apparently going to be heard today. And and I basically am asking why, and if not, when will I, these matters be heard? And that's, uh, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, I'm that's all before I go to my opening remarks regarding the FONSI. Sorry, can you repeat your last sentence? I don't understand what you were, what you said. Uh, I said, uh, I asked the two questions and then I said, I'm prepared to move ahead with my opening statement on the FONSI. You have not made your opening statement on the FONSI or you? I. You're muted. I 
have not yet made my opening statement on the Fonzie. It's short. Uh, uh, Mr. Church, the, just to be clear, as I stated, our agenda item, as was published today, is um, or published for today's meeting. Um, is was to consider the acceptance of your final environmental assessment. So when I asked for your comments at the beginning, they were, they were comments on the EA and the FONSI. If you have additional comments you wish to make, you should make them now. The uh, FONSI is basically a reprint of the EA with uh, modifications that have been noted on the first page of the FONSI. Uh, basically, strike through was used for words that didn't, like, for example, draft EA, I struck through and I double underlined any added text, which was, uh, so basically the word draft EA was, was uh, struck through and the double underline uh, text was added, proposed Fonzie. Generally, uh, that's pretty much uh, all the changes to the original EA. I will add that there was no letters of comment have been received uh, by us, and there's none posted on the LUC's website um, regarding the proposed Fonzie. Thank you, Mr. Church. This is your last chance to comment on anything regarding this agenda item. Understood? Correct. Okay. I will ask Mr. Ordinker, our executive officer, to explain why the boundary item request was not on this agenda. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Church has, has been informed of this. Um, there is a process for boundary interpretations. They are ministerial. They are not a matter for the commission uh, drafting tech um, handles those um, because they're a factual matter. Um, it, the boundaries are what the boundaries are. Um, there, if there is a boundary determination request, there is a process that needs Mr. Church needs to follow to apply for a boundary interpretation if that's what he's asking for. Um, and that's why it wasn't agendized uh, for the commission because it's not a matter before the commission it's a matter in front of staff and um, the, the drafting tech. Thank you, Mr. Ordenker. Commissioners, do you have any final questions for Mr. Church? Commissioner Cabal. Um, I'm concerned, um, I'm not quite sure this is a question, it might be more for staff than Mr. Church, but it appears that Mr. Church is um, indicating that he feels like the process isn't being uh, followed uh, as he he feels it should be, and I appreciate Executive Director Oren Decker's explanation. But I, I would I I know that we have procedures that we're mandated to follow, and I can appreciate that the attorneys who deal with us. Um, are familiar with those and that uh, Mr. Church is in fact the, himself the petitioner dealing with this, but is, should it be such that maybe we should consider delaying um, any action on this matter until Mr. Church's it, clarification is clearly made with Mr. Church as to what's, what's on the agenda and why it is or isn't on the agenda so that there's no follow-up objection later on. I just want to make sure everything's clear in, in his mind, or maybe he can then have time to consult with an attorney who, who um, understands these matters to get it clarified. Okay, I'm going to consider that was a question for Mr. Ordenker. Yes, okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Church has been sent um, the information necessary to complete, on the process necessary to complete a boundary interpretation. I mean, it, it it's up to the commission on whether one they want to defer this, but nothing is going to change. I mean, he, he is, we are in constant contact with Mr. Church. Sure, may, may, may I um, add something to that? Deputy A.G. Chow. 
So under the um, applicable LUC rules 15-15-22, subsection D, it says the executive officer may use all applicable commission records in determining district boundaries. So it appears from the rules that the initial determination of district boundaries is done by the executive officer. And then only under subsection F, whenever subsections A, B, C, D, or E cannot resolve an uncertainty concerning the location of any district line, the commission upon written application shall determine the location of those district lines. So, you know, I think the process is that the executive director and the staff makes an inter uh, initial determination of where the district boundary lines are or interpretation. And only if there is continued uncertainty would that then come to back to the commission or come to the commission. Thank you, Ms. Chow, for that response to Commissioner Cabral's comments. So just to confirm where we have been, Mr. Church was given an opportunity to present. He provided a general set of comments as well as specific comments on his Fonzie, the item that's in front of us now. We've asked internal questions of our staff. I believe that we are now done with the presentations on this matter. And we are actually now prepared to consider, I will consider a motion on the agenda item on whether or not the LUC accepts or does not accept the FEA and whether that motion would actually further authorize the LUC's executive officer to notify the Office of Environmental Quality Control and the parties that the LUC has made a decision on this matter. Any motion, whether it is to accept, deny, or defer should state the reasons for that motion. Chair. Sure. Commissioner Wong. Uh, I would like to make a motion. <laughs> Please. Uh, in the matter of um, docket number A18-805 Church, uh, Mr. Church, the petitioner, has provided all the relevant information covering the potential environmental impacts and proposed mitigation measures for this project. Um, I believe that we should accept the finding of no significant impacts as warranted by uh, HRS chapter 343 and HAR 11-201-13B and direct the executive officer to file notice of the commission's action together with the FEA to the Department of Health Office of Environmental Quality Control, direct the petitioner to work with the LUC staff to provide all the necessary documents for filing of the OEQC. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the motion, Commissioner Wong. Is there a second? I'll second it. Commissioner Ohigashi has seconded the motion. We are in discussion, commissioners. Chair. Commissioner Wong. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Mr. Church, reviewing your, um, as a lay person and not someone who's paid to do EAs, it, it was a very good EA for a lay person. Um, this, and I, that's why I want to make the motion to accept it and find no significant impacts. So I just wanted to say you did a very good job. And I, that's why I'm supporting this, uh, making this motion. Thank you, Commissioner Wong. Commissioners, we're in discussion on the motion. Is there any further discussion on the motion before us, Commissioners? If there is none, a motion has been made by Commissioner Wong and co seconded by Commissioner Ohigashi. Mr. Ordenker, please poll the commission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion is to accept a finding of no significant in impact and direct the executive officer to notice all that you see what he's saying. Commissioner Wong. Aye. Commissioner Ohigashi. Yes. Commissioner Cabral. Yes. Commissioner Axon. Yes. Commissioner Chang. Yes. Commissioner Giovanni is absent. Commissioner Okuda. Yes. 
Chair Scheuer. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Church. Um, I hope this provides some level of satisfaction to your long quest to be able to farm your property. Um, we are now going to go into recess. It is 10.26 a.m. Due to the actions of my internet provider not announcing they are doing work on my system, we will adjourn until 11.15 a.m. when I will physically relocate to the Land Use Commission offices for the continuance of this matter, taking up declaratory order DR, orders DR 2069 and DR 2070, County of Hawaii and Rose Hill et al. With that, we are adjourned for the moment, in recess, rather. What time? Keep in seat. But not including house trailer, multifamily unit, mobile home, hotel, or motel. The use of a farm dwelling would therefore be used by a person or persons that occupy the farm dwelling to cultivate the land or raise livestock upon the property on which the farm dwelling sits. The occupants of a farm dwelling would have a direct connection or supporting role to the farm or agricultural use of the property. A farm dwelling used as a short-term vacation rental lacks the connection with the agricultural use of the property because the occupant's use and purpose of their occupancy is for vacation or tourism lodging and not for bona fide agricultural use. Also, the exclusion of hotels and motels as a dwelling suggests that a farm dwelling is not intended for transient accommodations. Alternatively, the rental of a farm dwelling to a vacationer or tourist who would also receive income from the agricultural activity of the farm would not be reasonable given the short duration of stay and and purpose for occupying the dwelling. For these reasons, a short-term vacation rental does not fit within the definition of a farm dwelling. Regarding the Rose Hill et al. petition and arguments, first, petitioner's reading of the definition of farm dwellings is so narrow that it completely neglects the basic elements of the definition, its statutory context, and the obvious meaning of a short-term vacation rental use. The state land use classification system is exactly that. It's a complete system, not pieces to be broken off to be used in isolation of all else. You can't look solely at the definition of farm dwelling in order to, to, to determine the use of a short-term vacation rental. The state land use classification system, statutory interpretation in general, and common sense requires that you look at the complete definition and relevant language. You must evaluate both definitions against each other to, to determine whether a farm dwelling may be used as a short-term vacation rental, i.e. that it may be rented for 30 days or less. When you properly look at the definition of farm dwelling, which is a single family dwelling located on and used in connection to the farm, or where agricultural activity provides income to the family occupying the dwelling, and the meaning of a short-term vacation rental, which is a transient accommodation generally used by vacation or tourists, you must conclude that they clearly are not the same or compatible uses. Secondly, Hawaii Administrative Rules Section 1515-104 states, on petition of any interested person, the commission may issue a declaratory order as to the applicability of any statutory provision or of any rule or order of the commission to a specific factual situation. Repeatedly, the Rose Hill petitioners state the issue presented is very narrow and limited to whether as of June 4, 1976, Chapter 205 regulated the minimum rental period of farm dwellings. This is not fact specific. All the petitioners state is that they have been renting their single fam family dwellings in the agricultural district for 30 days or less. We can assume they are being rented as short-term vacation rentals because they are disputing the county's short-term vacation rental ordinance. But oddly enough, they never provide the commission with the actual use of their farm dwellings by the renters. This is not a specific factual situation upon, upon which this commission can apply the definition of farm dwelling because it turns in either direction depending upon these additional critical facts. Are the renters farming the land or is there agricultural activity providing income to the renters? Or are the renters vacationers or tourists? 
petitioners don't say. These are necessary details to assist you, the commission, in your decision. For example, a renter for 30 days or less that farms the land may be allowed under the definition of farm dwelling, but a renter for 30 days or less who does not farm the land but is merely renting as a vacationer would be prohibited under the definition of farm dwelling. As a result, petitioners are putting forth a speculative or purely hypothetical scenario which does not involve an existing situation or, which, or one which may reasonably be expected to occur in the near future because it lacks these important details. This is a ground for denial of the petition pursuant to Hawaii Administrative Rules, section 1515-100-A1A. Hawaii Administrative Rules, section 1515-104 states, an order, an order disposing of a petition shall apply only to the factual situation described in the petition or set forth in the order. It shall not be applicable to different fact situations or where additional facts not considered in the order exist. Thus, even with a favorable ruling for petitioners, uh, such ruling cannot be applied before the county because it will require additional facts. Consequently, petitioners petition fails to set forth a question, the resolution of which will resolve the controversy before the County Planning Commission. Based on the foregoing, the commission should grant the county's petition and deny the Rose Hill petition, and that even though the definition of farm dwelling does not expressly prohibit rentals of 30 days or less, farm dwellings may not be used for 30 days or less as a short-term vacation rental, and because petitioner fails to provide the commission with a specific enough factual situation upon which a declaratory ruling can be made. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Apuna. Commissioners, are there questions for Ms. Apuna? Call you first. Call you. No. Chair. Commissioner Wong. Uh, Ms. Apuna, question. Um, if you know, answer if you don't, just say you don't know. Do you know if these the short-term vacation rentals are paying general excise tax or TAT? Do I know if these specific petitioners are pay paying TAT? Yes, or general excise tax for their rental, the short-term vacations. I would not. Pers I would not know uh, specifically these petitioners whether they are or not, but. I think generally they are subject to the TAT tax. Okay. Um, so the other question I have is, Mr. Bell, the former, formal, uh, the former guy who testified before you, who witnessed, stated he's not a farmer, but he lives on site. So that's okay for Ag District, correct? Um, it's not a, uh, it's, it's a interesting question. I, I think it's, it's how you enforce it. I think people, they are on agricultural properties, but as far as how the county is able to enforce and make sure that that owner or tenant is actually the far, farming the land is a, is a question of uh, being able to see that that's happening. But I think generally the Ag District would, uh, the intent is to have people farming the land. Three participants have raised their hands. Okay, so the, the other question I have is, Nancy Garrett. Ag, for Ag District, you have to be farming such as, you know, as someone does grapefruit or, you know, raising goats or, doing something agricultural, correct? Correct. Um, so let's say I live on an ag lot and I just grow one papaya tree. Would that be considered agricultural in nature? Potentially. I don't think that there's specific standards as far as how much should, you know, qualifies as agricultural. So I, I could just keep uh, like a one horse or even a donkey on that, let's say a one acre property and say it's an ag property. Um, I can't answer that. I would have to look further at the 
statute or the code. Okay, uh, that's all, no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wong. Um, Commissioner Ohigashi. Lee. Yes, I mute myself. Uh, Commissioner. Yeah, you froze. Go ahead. Me? It's me. Oh. <laughs> so, Puna, I have. Yes. I have a question, and it, I think it came out of your. Your brief, I don't have it in front of me, but I seem to recall that you cite 15-1523 HAR saying that except as provided in this HAR and chapter uh, that uses not expressly permitted are prohibited. And you go on to say that this, this rule identifies those uses in 205A-2 and 205A-4.5. So my question is really is this, is this, is it your position that we've already declared that, ex, uh, that uses that are not expressly placed in the allowed are uses that are prohibited? I'm sorry, I, I missed the couple of words that you said you're asking if uses not expressly permitted are prohibited? No, well, we're, what I'm saying is, is it your position that using this particular rule that we've already declared or already stated for the record, that uses that are not specifically listed are prohibited? Yes, I think that's correct. Okay, I just wanted to know that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ohigashi. Um, Commissioner Cabral. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Apuna, for your comments. Um, I'm here on the Big Island, and I've got to tell you that the entire definition and use of agriculturally zoned land is a huge issue because a massive amount of our land is, in fact, inside that zoning and um, of various sizes, including very small parcels, less than one acre, all the way to larger uh, parcels. I myself live on agriculturally zoned land, but I have horses, cows, sheep, and the wild pigs, of course. So, but, um, and we do eat them, not the horses, but anyway. But um, my question is, um, and I think we, I think we need to be really clear. I, I'm afraid that it, to get into the definition of whether use as a single family dwelling complies, because I think it's a huge legal issue that has never been clarified and in selling real estate, it comes up all the time. So I think my, my question is going back to the focusing on the use of it as a uh, vacation rental because of this land, is, has, has been, um, by all evidence, has no agricultural activities on it. It is considered not agriculturally used, even when it's a short-term or long-term rental. By your definition, would you consider that in the event an, an activity on a property has, let's say, has horses, has a garden, has um, ag agricultural type activities going on, and then if the event that people came in and rented it on a short-term basis for the agricultural experience of grooming a horse, riding a horse, planting a, a vegetable or fruit or something, would you consider by your, your readings of this that that would be a permitted usage in agriculturally zoned land in the event that the occupant of the house is only there for a short time, but that the activity is in fact agricultural? That, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cabral. Yeah, I think that if you can show the connection between the user, the renter, as being a bona fide agricultural use or service, that they are supporting the agricultural uh, use of the property, then um, that potentially they could stay there for less than that. Arguably, they could stay there for less than 30 days.
Thank you, because I've had people over here ask me that very question on other egg lands. So thank you for, and I understand it's very confusing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cabral. Commissioner Okuda, followed by Commissioner Chang. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Ms. Apuna, for your testimony. So um, would you agree then that the starting point of any analysis is to is to determine whether or not the use and possibly in a case by case basis complies with the legal standards, including HRS 205-4.5, which is the statute which lists permissible uses within the agricultural district. It's a fact intensive uh, or fact specific sometimes evaluation or analysis. Yes. Okay. Um, and so there might be a situation where, uh, as, as you pointed out, uh, what might be considered by people in a general vernacular short term may be permissible or it might not be permissible. It depends on the specific facts of the specific situation. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay, thank you. I wanted to make sure I, uh, I understood you. Um, and, and this is not intended to be a strict question or anything. I just want to get your read and maybe later on Mr. Chip Chase and the county's uh, response to it. Uh, in preparing for this hearing, and I actually try to prepare, I came across this case which seems to suggest that uh, land use regulation, <clears throat> excuse me, is basically uh, a dual system. The State Land Use Commission can set district boundaries, which has certain requirements, but within those boundaries, except for the conservation district, which as we know from the Mauna Kea case is within the exclusive jurisdiction for management of the borderland and natural resources. But within the other districts, the counties themselves have the authority to fashion their own requirements within those districts. Is that a fair statement to your understanding? That's correct. Yeah, and, and uh, just so that if any of the other council have a uh, different view, the case I was looking at is Save Sunset Beach Coalition versus City and County of Honolulu. That's found at 102 Hawaii Reports 465, the Pacific Third citation is 78 Pacific Third, number one, uh, that's a 2003 case, and specifically at paragraph, or excuse me, page 482. And if you don't mind, if you can bear with me, if I can just read um, about three sentences uh, from that, that section. And, and my question is going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, does that, what I read, number one, is that an accurate statement of the law? And number two, if it's an accurate statement of the law, does that indicate that the county in this case has the legal right and ability to enact whatever uh, type of regulation it has with respect to short-term rentals uh, within the agricultural zone? And let me start with what the Hawaii Supreme Court said. In Hawaii's land use system, the legislature's statutory districts constitute more of a general scheme and, <clears throat> excuse me, and presumably by delegating authority to zone to the counties, the legislature intended that specific zoning be enacted at the county level. We believe that the quote, consistency doctrine, close quote, enunciated in Gatry, that's a T R I is somewhat instructive in the instant case because the uses allowed in country, and I believe that's a misspelling in the uh, opinion, it's spelled C O U N T R Y, but I believe the it should have said county C O U N T Y zoning, comma, are prohibited from conflicting with the uses allowed in a state agricultural district only a more restricted use as between the two is authorized. By adopting a dual land use designation approach, 
the legislature envisioned that the counties would enact zoning ordinances that were somewhat different from, but not inconsistent with the statutes. And that's the ending part of the quote. Uh, does that sound like an accurate statement of the law? Yes, that uh, the counties can further restrict or at least be consistent with or, uh, or, be, or further restrict the uses uh, as um, provided under statute. So, so in other words, to evaluate whether or not a county statute or regulation uh, should be uh, upheld or not upheld, of course, first we have to get over the hurdle with, with uh, the issue which you amply uh, briefed, whether or not the issue is really uh, appropriate for a declaratory uh, petition or declaratory ruling petition. But assuming we get over that hurdle, the, the issue then is which uh, approach is stricter and if the county has a stricter approach, it can be upheld as being consistent with the holding in the Sunset Beach Coalition versus City and County of Honolulu case. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. Okay, thank you, Chair. I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner Okuda. Um, the, the case you cited incidentally refers to a county zoning which was called country zoning. So I don't think it was a typographical error by the state Supreme Court. Um, Commissioner Chang. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Puna, for your testimony. I just have a few questions sort of following the line um, of Commissioner Okuda. But first, let me ask you this, and this is, uh, you know, asking for a legal opinion. Would you agree that the Land Use Commission has a legal authority to interpret Hawaii Revised Statutes 205-4.5? Yes. Um, do you agree that the county and the petitioner in this case, both stipulating to the declaratory action before the Land Use Commission also um, concur with that interpretation that the Land Use Commission has the authority to interpret 205A-4.5. Yeah, yes. And I suspect that this matter is probably gonna get appealed. So um, would you agree that on appeal, the appellate court would, in general, in the absence of you know, arbitrary and capriciousness, give deference to the administrative agency's interpretation of its own laws? Yes. Okay. I don't have any other further questions. Thank you very much. Commissioner Chang. Thank you, Commissioner Chang. Commissioners, are there further questions for the testifier? Seeing none, Mr. Derrickson, is there anybody who is a public attendee who is raising their hands who wishes to testify on this matter? No, Chair, I don't see anyone that's currently okay. trying to raise their hand. Uh, so seeing that there's no further public testimony on this matter um, and that we have been going for an hour and five minutes, I'm going to propose taking a five minute recess and then we will continue on the agenda past the public testimony. Recess for five minutes. Okay, it's 1225. Let's see. Where is that? Just Nancy. Six with Nancy. Someone got to call Nancy. I've been giving ten minutes. I'm just calling Nancy. Did he say that or next? Let me just see. Just judging by his. Or leave. 
or leak. Maybe someone can call that. See. Commissioner Cabral. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I just uh, just spoke to the executive director to inform him that I, I'm, I have to leave the meeting at one. I understand, Commissioner Higashi. Thank you. Oh, that was that was Commissioner Oigasi. I thought it was Colonel Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're the, actually we are the uh, Japanese offshoot of. <laughs> I remind the commission live and on the internet <laughs> and recorded for all time. And I will also remind everybody that comedian Commissioner Axon offers show at seven and nine with a two drink minimum. <laughs> All proceeds from his show go to the Hawaii Carpenters Fund. Um, Commissioner Cabral. Mr. Executive Officer. Oh, here she is. Can you hear us, Commissioner Cabral? Okay. okay, the gavel, which I've missed so much, we're back on the record. Thank you, parties. Um, there's no more public testimony on this matter. Um, so I will now hear from the petitioners, um, first the county and then the um, Rose Hill petitioners on their stipulation to consolidate. First, the county. Oh, the, the county agrees and has in fact signed the stipulation to consolidate the two matters. Thank you very much. C commissioners, any questions for the county? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Chip Chase, on behalf of the Rose Hill petitioners. Thank you, Chair. We believe consolidation is appropriate for the reasons set out in the petition, uh, and as has been done for this hearing, a consolidation, we believe, is the most efficient and cleanest way to approach this issue, and so we respectfully ask that the uh, stipulation for consolidation be approved and granted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sorry, one, one brief moment. Unless if you have it, any uh, commissioners have any questions? Okay, commissioners, do you have any comments or questions before we take a vote on the stipulation, to accept the stipulation? to consolidate. Mr. Ordinker, do we need a motion to that, to that effect? I don't, I don't believe so, Mr. Chair, it's been stipulated. Okay. So, so stipulated. So it's so stipulated. Um, Okay, so then we can go on and county, you can start with proceeding your, uh, presenting your main case. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and commissioners. Um, in this case, the um, Rose Hill petitioners state that, quote, the only question before the commission is whether as of June 5th, 1976, chapter 205 prohibited leases, and in parentheses, the same thing as rentals, of farm dwellings for a period of less than 31 days. Um, the county agrees that there's no prohibition on farm dwellings being rented for 30 days or less, but 
as we pointed out in our petition, it has to be framed in terms of agricultural use in connection with HRS 205, Section 2D7, which specifically defines farm dwellings and farm dwellings as defined in HRS 205-4.5A4. Uh, notes that within the agricultural district, a parenthesis for farm dwelling, which is defined specifically um, in section four. We are here um, to determine whether the renting of a dwelling as an STVR to an outside party, I mean, we're here to determine whether it's a permitted use um, in this matter. Uh, the Rose Hill petitioners note that the owner of a farm dwelling does not need to reside in the dwelling. Again, the county agrees. However, it must be agriculturally re related and has to be framed in terms of agricultural use. Um, the Hawaii Administrative Rules Section 15-15-03 also defines a farm dwelling as a single family dwelling located on and used in connection with a farm or where agricultural activity provides income to the family occupying the dwelling. So you simply cannot isolate portions of HRS 205-4.5 and expand it to make an argument that somehow short-term vacation rentals are a permissible use of a farm dwelling on lots created after June 4, 1976. Uh, and as we set forth in our petition, the definitions and uses for farm dwellings and short-term vacation rentals are in conflict as an STVR by its very definition in H Hawaii County Code, section 25-1.5, which notes that the owner or operator does not exclusively occupy the unit as a single family or even live on site. Um, the STVR owner must reside off site and temporarily rents the use of the unit to others. We would submit that this is in contrast to a farm dwelling that a family unit occupies while obtaining income from agricultural activities on a farm that the family owns in fee or leasehold. With regard to the uses of farm dwellings and STVRs, they're very distinct. A farm dwelling by its very nature is used in connection with a farm. Uh, why else would you call it a farm dwelling? It needs to be used in support of and an accessory to a farm farming operation and a farm dwelling's purpose is to be a bona fide agricultural service and use which supports and is an accessory to agricultural activities. The purpose of a short-term vacation rental is to provide transient accommodations or housing that will be temporarily rented for periods of 30 days or less. And I apologize, but last yesterday in the afternoon, I emailed to all the parties and the Land Use Commission, um, two exhibits that I hope are in your possession today. Um, one would be, and I apologize because we, I, I just ran across this, but one, the first exhibit, and if none of you have it, we will make it available. We'll provide it as soon as this hearing is completed. Um, but the first one is what's called a farm dwelling notice. And this has to be filed with the County of Hawaii Planning Department. The residential use on the farm dwelling um, is not prohibited, but they must file this document. And in fact, someone like Mr. Bell, who testified earlier, we would, we would submit that his... Excuse me, County, one moment. Um, I want to first confirm with the parties um, okay. that, that, that indeed this was received. Um, first of all, uh, Rose Hill at all, Cal, did you receive? 
Yes, Chair, we did. Okay. Um, and I am aware that at very late last night, the administrative officer for the Land Use Commission received your email, but I don't know that those were transmitted on, um, due to the late hour to the commissioners themselves. Mr. Ardenko. Okay. I, I, yeah, I, again, I apologize for the the submission yesterday afternoon, but I will make we, we we'll make sure that all commissioners um, have the two exhibits. Okay. Thank you. You can continue with your oral. Okay. So, so, with regard to this first exhibit, we would submit that um, I, I think there was a inquiry with one of the commissioner as to. Uh, whether Mr. Bell's property or his 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 residence, um, or why 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 can he just live there and not perform farming activities? Um, he has to file this farm dwelling notice with the county, and his residence is considered a farm dwelling, and there's nothing that disallows him from simply having a residence on an agriculture zoned property. Um, the second exhibit that I transmitted um, for the commissioner's review would just simply be an additional farm dwelling application agreement. And we would point out that on this notice, a farm dwelling does in fact re reference section 205 dash 4.5 section A4 as a single family dwelling located on and used in conjunction with a farm. And by its very description, um, we, we would submit that a short term vacation rental is simply not used in connection with a farm with agricultural supporting activities from which the unit's occupants obtain income. So as such, and we would submit that the County of Hawaii respectfully requests that the commission rule that farm dwellings may not be used as short-term vacation rentals pursuant to HRS section 205-2 and 205-4.5 and also sections 1515-03 of the Hawaii Administrative Rules. Thank you very much. Was that it for now? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, commissioners, questions for the County of Hawaii? Commissioner Okuda, followed by Commissioner Chang. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, question to the county and anyone on the county's uh, table or room can answer this question. So is it the county of Hawaii's position that a residence may be constructed and lived in on land that's within the land use agricultural district? even if there is no agriculture taking place on that parcel of property? And, and for the record, this is Michael Yee, Planning Director. Yes, that is correct. So in other words, the County of Hawaii sees no violation of HRS section 205-4.5 if I were to build a uh, very large mansion, uh, you know, the square footage, the largest that the county would allow under its applicable zoning code. And if I told you flat out, by the way, I'm not gonna do any agriculture. And if I see anybody in my family trying to grow anything, I'm gonna cement it over with my cement truck. And that in your view would be permissible under HRS 
205-4.5. Michael, you again. I would, I would just state again that we, we allow people to build a residence on agricultural land. And it's a farm dwelling. Right. And so, and it, it is a farm dwelling. Sorry, um, I, I think I actually have to swear you in just procedurally, Mr. Yee, if you're going to be giving testimony. Do you swear our testimony you're going to give us the truth? I do. Thank you. Chair Okuda. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, in other words, Mr. Yee, even if I tell you, and in fact, I tell you in writing, that my intention is I do not intend to engage in any agriculture. All I intend to do is build a house to live in. The County of Hawaii would consider that consistent with HRS 205-4.5. Yes, and we would consider it a farm dwelling. Or Even if there's no- We cannot see- the, the identifying yourself before speaking is very for the record. That, uh, Michael, you, you, yes, they could build the residence and we would consider it a farm dwelling. Even if there was no farming going on. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Okuda. Commissioner Chang. Yes, um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, to the county of Hawaii, I just want to follow up. So how do you tax an agricultural property that has a farm dwelling on it? Is it tax agriculture? Is it tax residential? How do you tax it? Uh, on, on behalf of the county of Hawaii, this is John Mukai. Um, this, we, that we don't tax. Um, this department does not tax. So I don't think anyone in the room can answer this question now. So I apologize for that. Um, okay, that's kind of unfortunate. Um, let, me, let me ask you this question. Um, can you confirm that the petitioners applied to the Hawaii County um, to certify their property as short-term vacation rentals. I'm sorry, could you please repeat the question? Sure, I wanna confirm with the county that the petitioners filed um, with the Hawaii County to seek a certification uh, to use their property as short-term vacation rentals. Yeah, yes, they did. They submitted their applications and it was denied. Is that Mr. Mukai? Yes, I apologize. That was John Mukai from the County of Hawaii. Thank you. And, and Mr. Mukai, can you just confirm also that the application did not say it was a farm dwelling? If you know. Yeah, they, what they did, what they did was apply for a short-term vacation rental. Uh, it was nothing along the lines of we're applying to be a farm dwelling. Okay. Um, Again, that was John Mukai, County of Hawaii. Okay. Um, the next question is, if you know, do you know how these properties are being advertised? If you know. Online this is Michael Yee from the county. Michael Yee, uh, you know, I don't know specifically, but it, it, you know, there are a lot of online platforms that are used uh, quite regularly for most vacation rentals in Hawaii. Okay. Um, okay. And this, I guess this is going to be a question from Mr. Yee. It's a legal one, similar to what I asked the Office of Planning. Um, 
Is it your legal opinion that the Land Use Commission has the authority to interpret Hawaii Revised Statutes 205-4.5? Oh, yes, uh, this is John Mukai for the County of Hawaii, yes. Okay. And okay. Um, I okay, I have no other question, thank you. Commissioner Ohigashi. The form that you indicated that they would sign, that Mr. Bell would sign, would be a farm dwelling kind of agreement, or is that what you're talking about? Uh, yes, Commissioner, it would be called a farm dwelling notice. That Did he, oh, this is John Mukai again. What he would uh, submit to the county is what's called a farm dwelling notice, and his residence would be considered a farm dwelling. Was there any of the participants or, or the petitioners that Mr. Chip Chase represent, did they, any of them sign that agreement? I would assume so, but I haven't confirmed uh, I not, not to my knowledge. So your records would show no, none of his, none of the members of his who he is representing has signed that agreement. Michael Yee, I, we would have to go into each file to confirm uh, that the farm dwelling notice was signed by each property. I probably won't be here when you, uh, when Mr. Chip Chase comes up, so I won't be able to answer that. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ohigashi. Um, Commissioner Okuda? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and anyone at, at the county can answer this question. This is in follow-up to the last series of questions. So can you tell me then, if the county is not requiring active farming to uh, allow a person to build a residence on agriculturally districted property, what then is the real difference between a, a short-term rental of renters who come onto the property who are not going to be engaged in any type of farm activity and the person who lives in in the house that they built which you say you'll approve even if that person is not also engaged in farming i mean what is the rational difference between the two uh, john mukai for the county well because the Short-term vacation rental um, needs, it, it's in a resort uh, type zoning area. And again, the renting of the dwelling as an STVR to an outsider um, uh, is not a permitted use. And an STVR cannot be used as a farm dwelling. Well, well may, may I ask this question then? If, if I came into the county and said I was going to build a residence on agriculturally districted and zoned land, and I told you in writing, and by the way, I don't plan to live there. I plan to rent it out to somebody for, let's say, longer than 30 or 40 days. Would you consider me in violation of any land use ordinance or law? Yeah, yes, my understanding is longer, this is John Mukai, longer periods of rental would be allowed under the, uh, under the ag. So in other words, the county's objection is not that there's no agricultural use regarding the short-term vacation rental. It's just that it's a short-term vacation rental, correct? Yes, yes. 
Okay, thank you. Well, no further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Commissioner Okuda. Commissioner Wong? Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, I, I, I gotta get this straight, okay. So let's say I'm Mr. Bell. I have a piece of property. I am not the, the it's zone ag. And I would say, hey, uh, I would tell my friends, hey, you're gonna come take, use my house for 29 days and just give me a dollar. That'd be okay? Is that how we're seeing it? I, I think we're, we're talking specifically in this case about a short-term vacation rental permit, which is, I think that that's not really the situation that we're dealing with here, so. So the question I have is, if Mr. Chip Chase's clients didn't turn in that short-term vacation rental form or whatever to the county, and they just rented it out, that'd be okay. So doing, so having a short-term vacation rental without a permit, yes, that would not be legal. But, sorry, I'm trying to figure this out. You said that if we, okay, so let's say, Again, I'm taking Mr. Bell, or let's say I have a property, zone ag, and I, I rent it to the chair for 31 days. Is that okay? And it's not a short term vacation? Yeah. yeah no. By yeah. definition, it's not. Yeah. By, by definition, it's not a short term vacation rental. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I'm a. Uh, this, this local boy is a little confused on this issue now um, because I, I, I'm trying to get my head around this one. So you're saying that as long as I turn in this form that say I'm having a short-term vacation rental and on ag land that it won't be allowed. But if I'm a farmer who's renting out my property to someone that's not gonna do farming, it's okay. We we'll have April try and... Oh, hello, how this is? Oh, hold on. Uh, first of all, I'm having some audio issues with you, and then I also have to swear you in. So um, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us the truth? I thank you. April Supernot, um, Acting Deputy Planning Director for the Planning Department. So the permits that we're talking about specifically with the Rose Hill petitions have to do with non-conforming uses. So in the law, in the, in the county's um, zoning code, short-term vacation rentals are only allowed in certain zones. Ag is not one of them. However, when the law was brought into place, we allowed for some non-conforming uses that were already in operation under very clear parameters in the law. And so if people met those parameters and they included um, all of the information that was needed by the time frame that was required, um, and they met all of those conditions as spelled out in our code, then we issued them a non-conforming use um, vacation rental permit. That is not the case for the Rose Hill um, group of petitions. They did not meet the parameters of the law and specifically is related to the post-76 agricultural lots. And so that's why we're before the commission today to request a declaratory ruling on whether or not the use of short-term vacation rentals is allowed in your, um, in your opinion on state land use ag land. So I'm, I'm just gonna really narrow my focus on 
short-term vacation rentals so that this is sorry it's, this is my thought if i was a farmer and i'd say hey um jonathan chair jonathan why don't you come and farm for 29 days on my lot and just plant this papaya tree that would be okay then correct that's all i'm asking if it's if it's being advertised and used as a vacation rental, that would not be allowed unless you had a non-conforming on ag land, a non-conforming use permit in order to do that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. No other questions? Thank you very much, Commissioner Wong. Commissioners, further questions? Uh, Commissioner Okuda. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, anyone in the county's room can answer this question. Um, you know, one of, in, in reading the submissions, it seemed like one of the arguments uh, in favor of the county's position was that short-term vacation rentals have a, a negative impact or effect on bona fide agriculture taking place in an agricultural district. But if, the, but if the county is not requiring that there's actual agriculture taking place when you grant permits to build the main residence, aren't you in fact contributing to driving up the cost of agricultural land to the detriment of bona fide farmers who need land if we're gonna have real farming in this state? So this is April Serpernat again, acting um, deputy planning director. No, I don't think that we are contributing to what you're speaking of. Our code allows for a dwelling to be built on agriculture land. For example, however, if someone wanted to build an additional dwelling on agricultural land, they do have to show um, extensive uh, information about um, how the land is being used for agriculture um, and why and how they require an additional farm dwelling in order to be productive, um, in order to um, facilitate the productive farm use of that land. Okay, final question. What case or legal authority states that it is permissible to allow residential use of, of land that's in an agricultural district if there is no actual agriculture taking place on that land. What's the legal authority case or otherwise that says that? One moment, I'm just gonna reflect for the record that Commissioner Ohigashi has left the meeting. Please now continue. Thank you, Chair. That was my question. What is the legal authority? Either give me a case citation or a statutory citation that states it is permissible to have residential use on property that's owned agriculture, even if there is no agriculture taking place. Okay, um, we're looking up the zoning code right now, so it, it might take a minute or two. I apologize. Well, let me be more specific. What in the state law, either state law or, or uh, appellate cases, because this is really a, a question of the, of the uh, requirements of Chapter 205, specifically 205-4.5, where does it say that is, it is permissible to have residential use of agricultural land without bona fide or, or actual agriculture taking place. It looks like the county got lost for a little bit. Okay. We're yeah. still here verbally. Can you hear us verbally? Oh, there, we, there you are. You're back. Uh, 
Auntie? Well, I don't I don't want to, Chair, I don't want to take up any time. Uh, the parties can supplement the record later if that's necessary. Thank you, Chair. I have no further questions. Okay. I, would, I would just, this is John Mukai again. I would just, again, direct, direct the commission to HRS 205-4.5, section four, which specifically talks about um, farm dwellings um, and uses in connection with a farm, including clusters of single family farm dwellings permitted within agricultural parks developed by the state or where agriculture activity provides income to the family occupying the dwelling. Again, we would point out to our, uh, the commission that my, the exhibit we submitted yesterday um, the, the, the residence is considered a farm dwelling on the agricultural land. Uh, just noting for the record that we have yet to receive the exhibit as commissioners. Um, Commissioner Chang. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, County, I'm gonna go down the same line of questioning. Mr. Chipchase may not even have to say anything, but um, I was just, so I'm trying to understand because I think the Office of Planning provided their testimony, well, provided, provided their position. And I think that it, it joined in the county's position. And as I understood the Office of Planning's position is that you have to look at the zoning and it's agriculturally zoned. So uh, agriculture district, so it has to be in support of ag, of ag use. So um, the question I have for the county, if the petitioners filed this farm dwelling notice and not as a short-term vacation rental, and they advertise it as a farm dwelling for use less than 30 days, 29 days, um, that would be a permissible use under the county's interpretation? If Michael Gee, uh, Planning Director, Hawaii County, if they're renting less than 30 days, by definition, uh, it's a short-term vacation rental. And so if they're not in a permitted area or have a permit, then it's uh, not prohibited. But what makes, what happens if they have, um, let's say they've got, um, um, you know, is the fact that they are, they are um, renting it for less than 30 days, that is what makes it a short-term vacation rental? Is that the only fact? Michael Yee, within our ordinance, we had defined short-term vacation rentals as less than 30 days. And they have to be in a resort zone area to be permitted. Correct, and only in certain districts. And that was John Mukai, sorry. Okay. But you are taking a different position from Office of Planning. You're the, the agriculture, well, the farm dwelling or the residential use does not have to be in support of agriculture. You are, your interpretation is that it can be a residence, no agricultural use on the property. It's in an agriculture district, but um, it's not, you, the county's interpretation is it does not have to be related to agricultural use. Our, our zoning code allows it. Okay. If, if the Land Use Commission um, decided based upon this, this petition that um, our interpretation is that it has to be associated with agricultural use. Um, how does that affect the county of Hawaii? Because you, your laws have, can be stricter, but it cannot be more liberal. Well, I, th I think the impact, Michael Yee, uh, there'd be a serious impact of trying to have first farm dwelling units, which are residences, have to show agricultural activity be before the owner could build the residence. 
right? If we went around through the state of Hawaii having to require folks start agricultural activity and then say, hey, it's okay for you to build your residence there on this property, it, it, it would be um, very difficult to, to administer that way. Uh, to a certain extent, I think we certainly have many owners who buy property, ag land, who have every intention of wanting to farming, but they're going to build the residence first and then start the agriculture down the road. But, but wouldn't you also agree that there are many owners who purchase agricultural lands and put on a dwelling, not with the intention of farming, so that they are taking away valuable farming land from true agricultural purposes? that if you wanted to put a residence, that you could put it up in an urban area or a rural area. Well, I guess there's no prohibition from outsiders coming in and buying property. It happens and it's happening a lot. Yep, okay. Um, yeah, I've got no further questions. Thank you. That last response was Mr. Mukai? Yes, that was Mr. Mukai. Okay. Yes, yeah, and I apologize again. No, this is, uh, we're all trying to deal with an unusual set of circumstances. Um, commissioners, are there further questions for the county? If, oh. Commissioner Wong. Sure. Um, I, I, I need to, can I ask the county questions afterwards? I mean, I'm still trying to get this in, under my head later down the line after maybe Mr. Chip Chase presents. Um, it, it certainly occurs to me that given the consolidated proceedings and given what we will undoubtedly learn from Mr. Chip Chase's presentation, that we will wanna ask further questions of the county um, and perhaps after the county responds further questions to Mr. <coughs> Chip Chase, is that acceptable to both parties? As yeah, that's, that's fine. Certainly, oh, Chair. That was, that was okay, thank you. Um, did you have something further, Commissioner Wong? Yeah, the only other question I have for the county for now is, um, let's say the dwelling was built legally and was initially for farming, then wanted to do a short-term vacation rental, what, how would you stop them? Would you tell them to tear down the entire house? Or, I mean, how would you stop them besides fines? This is April Serpernat. So again, Short-term vacation rentals are not allowed on ag land. And so if they were um, found to do that, which we are putting things in place to help um, uh, find those individuals who are doing, trying to do short-term vacation rentals, advertising as short-term vacation rentals um, without the required permits in order to enforce this legislation, which is similar to what other counties are doing within the state. And so they may get away with it for a time until they're caught, and then they would receive fines and be required to stop renting as a short-term vacation rental. Um, but they would obviously be able to maintain their residence and could use the land for agricultural purposes. Okay, okay. so going on to that issue is Again, I, I think I asked this question. I just want to reaffirm. So let's say I am a farmer. I built the, the property legally, and I'm going to rent it out to a farmer from Connecticut for 29 days. And he's going to build, a, build uh, plant some papaya trees. That would be legal. Generally, this is April Supernaut. Generally speaking, no. However, the, the primary way that we will, we will identify those individuals who are trying to rent as short-term vacation rentals, we're putting those mechanisms in place to um, enforce that law. 
Okay. I, I just want to make sure because let's say I'm not renting it as a short term, but I'm renting it as a as a l l farming experience on Hawaii. <laughs> so you know, it's a different statement. You're learning how to farm in Hawaii. That'd be legal. It's still, it's still a short term vacation rental. If you're if you're bringing people in to stay in on the property for a short period of time and the owner is not residing there, it's still considered a short-term vacation rental. It's okay. possible that there are some activities on ag land that could qualify under the state um, statutes and under the county zoning code that may qualify to be able to apply for a special permit. But obviously that's not before us today. Okay, so let me take a little step further. Let's say I rent, I, I have this, I don't want to say mansion, but I have a 10, uh, six bedroom house on property. I am a farmer on site and I bring someone in and I'm still living there. Would that be okay? Under our, this is April, super so not, under our definition of short-term vacation rental, that does not qualify the short-term vacation rental so it's not prohibited if the if the if the owner is living on the premises then that does not fall under our statutes for short-term vacation rental okay uh, no other questions for now chair thank you thank you commissioners mm -hmm. Com commissioner cabral uh, thank you um, this line of questioning and answers brings up more questions to me. My, my understanding of it is really not what the structure of the building looks like um, so much as, or what it was originally permitted as, or what it was originally used as, but really what the current usage is, i.e., if I were to go out there and it's, it's zoned agriculture, but the usage I wanted to put on it was to put a 7-Eleven type store into it that is clearly retail, that is an unpermitted use. Or is, uh, my, I guess my question is to Hawaii County and probably to April. So it, are we talking a sort of a similar kind of question? It's not a permitted usage. I can't put the 7-Eleven in my agriculturally zoned house, even though when I built the house, it was okay to have it as a house to live in. I mean, I, we're, I'm trying to clarify, I know it's, it's very complicated and it's very important and over here, it's a big thing. But um, we're real, I think I keep wanting to focus on what is the usage of the property, not how did the property get to that usage, but what is that current usage? So like a 7-Eleven is not permitted in an agriculturally zoned land on any island. Is that correct, April? Is that, I mean, am I in the right direction or am I confused? This is April. Yes, you are. Uh, you are. Thank you for asking that question. And yes, that is that is exactly what we're talking about. No, a 7-Eleven would not be a permitted use. Um, and and to further answer the last commissioner's question about someone coming to stay, even though there's someone living there, it's likely that that could fall under the definition of say a bed and breakfast, and would therefore on Agland require a special permit. Okay, uh, thank you for the clarification. I know it's a very complex issue and it's gravely important over here because I handle about a hundred rentals, long-term long -term rentals on agriculturally zoned land. So I'm very involved in this. And I, I, I will disclose that this could have ramifications to my financial future, if, if, depending on where we go with this. None of mine are vacation rentals at all, not with my knowledge, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Hold, hold on. Uh, given Commissioner Cabral's statement. statement of disclosure that she has a possible financial interest in the outcome of this matter, I'm first going to ask Commissioner Cabral to further clarify how she may or may not have a financial interest in the way manner in which the land use commission makes this decision uh, decision okay. that is i actually don't think i have a financial interest in it i my companies um, day Lum rentals and management 
handles about 550 rental houses or properties in East Hawaii and uh, about 33 condominium or subdivision homeowners associations and about 280 commercial locations and four HUD projects, um, housing and urban development subsidized low income housing projects. I do not handle any vacation rentals. I've had agents in the past who handled them who had their sales license with me, but I do not have any that we handle as a company, nor do I think any of my agents handle them because I don't allow them to handle rentals as sales agents because I am also the owner of Coldwell Banker Daylum Properties. So I don't believe in this direct question I have. What I would consider to be a concern is that I see the line of questioning going to, okay, is it really legal that a residential house, okay, it's agriculturally zoned land, it's always been ag agriculturally zoned land, it's one acre, in some cases it's 20,000 square feet, but it's zoned ag over here. Um, and they are, but they are, I, I handle it as a rental, purely as a rental with no agricultural activity. So. Moment. Okay, that's my, that would be only if this got crazy and went in that direction. Okay. Commissioner Cabral. Yes. If I may. So the, the only question in front of us right now is ruling on the declaratory order petitions from the Rose Hill petitioners and the county, which specifically have to do with the operation of short-term vacation rentals on agriculturally zoned land. And I understood you have said that you do not personally own or your company does not manage any such properties. Right. Is that correct? Correct. With that, I think that I'm going to just clarify for the record that despite your earlier statement, you don't actually have a financial conflict which, with what is being decided here now. Correct. With this, with this question, I do not feel like I have a financial conflict with the, the current question. And I will ask both parties to confirm that they are fine with Ms. Cabral's continued deliberations on this matter. Uh, John Mukai, County of Hawaii. Uh, no objection. Thank you. No objection, Chair. Okay, thank you. With that, I would like to take a 10 minute recess um, before we continue with any questioning of the county and move on to the presentation of Mr. Chip Chase. It is 1.18 p.m. Let's reconvene at 1.28 p.m. Okay, got seven minutes, seven minutes. Anybody need me? That's what it's my screen said from you. I was here, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that you were here. Thank you very much, Commissioner Cabal. Okay. Having lunch now. Okay. We have Commissioners Okuda, Wong, Scheuer, Cabral, Axon, and Chang. Six commissioners. County, and we are awaiting Mr. Chip Chase. NOP. Chang. And. Uh, Ms. Apuna as well. Chip Chase on, or yeah. on, Linda Chow on, Hawaii County. On. Mr. Chip Chase, is that a virtual background making you look lawyerly, or is that an actual background? That's an actual background, Chair. I, I assume the executive directors or executive officers is an actual background, too. <laughs> Uh, and it's nice to yes, be. Yes, it, it most certainly is. I've been drifting out here for so long. There's somebody to pull me back to Star date. Yeah. But my uh, wheelchair. I, I just asked because I suddenly expect you to start talking that if I was in a car accident, I should call you. So, um. that, that might create a conflict of interest, Chair, and I wouldn't want to do that. Thank you. Um, yes, we're trying to avoid conflicts of interest here. Uh, <laughs> on the record, um, and we are continuing with questions for the county's presentation. Commissioners, were there further questions for the county? If not, I had um, Commissioner Chang. I'm sorry, Chair, it just won't take very long. What is a procedural question? You had indicated that um, you were going to hear from 
Mr. Chip Chase and then perhaps bring the county back on. Is it also possible to bring the Office of Planning back on? Um, we can recall a witness, that's correct. Okay, so my final question to the county is, because um, I know Mr. Mukai, you said you don't know what kind of taxes the petitioners are paying, but is it your understanding that real property taxes are different whether your residence is on agricultural zone land or whether it's on um, urban zone land. This is John Mukai. I, I would imagine so. It's just that I, I, I don't know how real property tax does their assessments and uh, tax uh, collections. I, I apologize. Um, okay, and you probably can't answer the question about why would taxes be lower on agricultural lands than on urban lands, even if it's for the even if it's for residential prop resi for residents. Yeah, I, I again we. We cannot an we, we can't answer questions and this would be more directed to the real property tax office. All right, I have no further questions. Okay. That last response was from you, Mr. Mukai. Is that correct? Y yes, and again I apologize. It's okay. We're all again trying to figure out how to do business during a pandemic. So um, we should all ex ask for great grace and expect it. Um, I'm going to say, before I recognize Commissioner Cabral, I've seen your hand, I know you want to speak. Um, I'm just going to point out here, because Commissioner Chang asked us about procedures that we're in, I want to just make sure that all of us understand where we're at. According to the Commission's administrative rules, specifically Section 1515-100, within 90 days after the receipt of a petition for declaratory order, we either shall deny the petition in writing, stating the reasons for denial, issue the declaratory order, or set the matter for hearing, as provided in sections 15, 15, 103 of the Commission's rules. In addition, section 15, 15, 102 of the Commission's rules provides that the Commission can, for good cause, refuse to issue a declaratory order by giving specific reasons. So, my intention with the time that we have available today is absolutely to hear from Mr. Chip Chase, perhaps have um, some further questioning of the Public Witness Office of Planning as well as further questioning of the county, but we can either act to grant or deny today, or we can decide as a commission to schedule this for a hearing, if there's further questions necessary. With that said, Commissioner Cabral. Um, just to try and pr provide information, I, I actually I pulled up the new rate for Hawaii County. Residential, so when you're actually having it as residential use, you pay $11.10 for the first, for per thousand dollars of assessed value for the first two million and more of your house is worth more than two million. And if you're agriculturally zoned, it's $9.35 and hotel and resort $11.55. And if you're a owner occupant and you declare that it's six dollars and fifteen cents for per thousand dollars, so there are differences in the tax rate between plain residential, which would mean it could be a rental, um, and uh, versus agriculture nine dollars and thirty five cents versus owner occupant. There are um, different rates. Thank. You. Hopefully that helps you. Commissioners, any further questions? If not, at this time, I have a couple of questions for the county. Um, following up on the questions from Commissioner Wong, first of all, um, I have understood the county's statements to be that you believe that under the ordinance, which was recently passed, regulating short-term vacation rentals, the short-term vacation rentals are not authorized in the agricultural district, but with a special permit, you believe that bed and breakfast may be authorized in the agricultural district? Uh, 
That is possible, yes. I'm sorry, <laughs> April Super, not Deputy Director. And your response was, Deputy? Yeah. Um, and is that because Chapter 205 specifically allows for bed and breakfast as an acceptable use in the agricultural district? Um, I think that is listed under the provisions for special permit. Okay. Um, my second question has to do with the county's take on the Office of Planning's brief. Specifically on page seven of the Office of Planning's brief, they note or they speak and summarize the county's position that farm dwellings existing prior to June 4th, 1976 may continue to operate as short-term vacation rentals as a non-conforming use. That that OP summarizes the county's position as that and OP disagrees. And the crux of OP's disagreement, if I understand it correctly, is that short-term vacation rentals were somehow allowed as a use in the agricultural district prior to that date. What is the county's response? Well, my, my understanding is that, or oh, John Mukai, uh, my understanding is that uh, it was based on the definition of farm dwelling under section 205 and certain um, uses were grandfathered in. Now, whether or not the Office of Planning uh, disagrees or not, we don't think that is before you, and I do not believe uh, it is uh, any part of the relief sought in this uh, particular matter. Thank you, Mr. Mukai. Well, again, John Mukai, perhaps Ms. Apuna could comment on that. Hmm. Um, I'll call up Ms. Apuna later um, if, when the commissioners have questions for her. But if there's nothing further for the county right now, I, I sincerely want to give Mr. Chip Chase a chance to present his case. Is there anything further for the county at this time, commissioners? If not, Mr. Chip Chase, can you begin by sharing a bit of just a sense of how long you might want to take, at least on this first bite. Absolutely, Chair. Uh, Cal Chip Chase for petitioners, Linda K. Rosehill and the other individual petitioners. My uh, presentation, or at least my initial comments to the, to the commission are under 30 minutes. They were under 20 before we began today, they've grown. Uh, and that growth, I will try to answer some of the questions that came up along the way, uh, but that's about how long I will take. Okay, thank you very much for that overview and please proceed, Mr. Chip Chase. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I will also add that we, we have a brief PowerPoint presentation today, which I'll, I'll put up on the screen and hopefully you'll be able to see it and me uh, if, if uh, technology works as it should. If not, you'll see one of us. The, the PowerPoint will be provided to the commission so that everybody has a hard copy and that it's part of the records. Uh, other than that, we have no uh, additional exhibits and stand on the papers that were filed. Um, uh, what I wanted to talk about today with you, and, and, and you've gotten into the merits quite deeply in your questioning of the other, uh, both public witnesses and the county, but I want to talk a little bit about who we are, who the petitioners are, uh, how we got here, why this is a question before the LUC. I want to talk about what this case is about uh, but I also want to talk about what it's not about, what, what isn't before the commission, what, what doesn't matter for purposes of the commission's decision. Uh, I'm going to take through what we believe to be an appropriate analysis of the question that is before the commission, and then conclude with the outcome that we believe is not only appropriate, but is consistent with state law. In, in terms of who the petitioners are, they are owners of lots within the agricultural district. Those lots are located in Kailua Kona, Kamawela, and Captain Cook. Uh, all of their lots were created before June 5th, 1976, and, and we'll talk about why that date is important. 
Commissioner Chang had asked earlier whether uh, any of or all of the petitioners had signed a farm dwelling notice. I, I did ask that question of, of my clients coming as, as it came up today. I don't have an answer for you, uh, but it doesn't really matter. That's not a, a question that is before the commissioner. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the answer uh, to the question that is before the commission. As the chair said at the beginning, and I'll emphasize a bit later, we're really dealing with the question of interpretation of, of state law. And so to answer Commissioner Chang's question to the other two witnesses, I do agree that the LUC has jurisdiction and authority to interpret and apply uh, chapter 205. Specifically here, as we'll see, the question is chapter 205 as it existed on June 5th, 1976. I, I would part with the, the other uh, uh, counsel in this case in saying that the, the courts defer to the agency's interpretation generally. Uh, they only defer if the statute is ambiguous. Here, there is no ambiguity in the relevant portions of the statute. No, no party, none of the petitioners or the, the, the county have claimed there's an ambiguity. OP as a public witness has not said there's an ambiguity, and there is none. We can read the words and understand what they mean. It's not susceptible to two reasonable or conflicting interpretations, which would be the standard. So I, 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 it's ultimately a question of law interpretation of the statute and and the LUC is able to do that under its authority. Um, I will say that while the the uh, I can't answer the question of whether the farm dwelling notice was uh, signed by my clients there is no dispute that that all of the homes that are on the the dwellings that are on the lots were lawfully constructed as a matter of state and county law nobody has come in and said otherwise. Again, that's not a fact that is, is critical or, or even relevant to the commission's answer to the question of law, but I wanted to provide that background because some, some questions had come up around it. Um, and I, I'll also say and, and offer uh, to everyone and to the court reporter, we are dealing with, we're all dealing with tech, technology and technology as we've seen today is uneven. So if I can't be heard clearly, uh, if, if I speak too quickly for this medium, you know, please let me know before anybody uh, is frustrated or isn't able to understand what I'm trying to say. I'm happy to adjust it, it, as necessary. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome, Chair. So, so after hearing a little bit about who we are, let me talk about how we got here, why, why we're up before the LUC. And the reason is, quite simply, because the county... Uh, of Hawaii changed its land use regulation. And, and as a general matter, that would not be a question for the LUC. The county regulating land is not something that normally comes up uh, as an issue for the state, for the LUC. And, and that's because land can be regulated to a certain extent. And as, as Commissioner Okuda pointed out uh, in the Obayashi case, it's safe Sunset Beach, but it's kind of commonly known as the Obayashi case, uh, uh, did say Justice Okoba held quite clearly that, that um, uh, the more restrictive uh, uh, provision in the agricultural district control. So the county can't regulate less than or restrict uh, less than state law provides, but it can restrict more. And so you have county laws that restrict agricultural activities in different ways that, that Chapter 205 might. The big difference is those are all perspective, forward looking. So if I'm using a property today, and my use is lawful, the county can say, you know what, as of tomorrow, nobody else can start this use in this area. And you, existing use, can't expand your use. You can't grow it. But the county can't tell me I can't continue the use. The county can't say it was lawful on Monday, it's unlawful on Tuesday. That would be wildly unconstitutional. Instead, we would say that the property owner, the user, has a vested right to continue the use of the property as it was, we would call it a lawful non-conforming use, or we would say that the use is grandfathered because these restrictions operate prospectively. Certainly, the county could not do uh, uh, what it has done here, and that is to say your use is not only unlawful prospectively, but it was actually unlawful for 40 years, and you just didn't know it. And so I'll, I'll put that in the context of an example. Um, you're operating a dairy farm on, on land and, and that use is lawful today. The county tomorrow can say no new dairy farms. We, we've revised our zoning code. We're not allowing new dairy farms in this area. 
It can even say you existing farm can't grow your operation. You can't have more acreage. You can't add your cows. There's some limitation on what you can do fixed by what you were doing. That's generally okay. What it can't do is say on Monday, your dairy farm was okay, but on Tuesday, your dairy farm is not. It can't simply declare a use, an existing lawful use, unlawful. And it certainly can't go back in time and say for 40 years, it turns out your dairy farm was unlawful. You just didn't know. That's exactly what the county has tried to do here. And the way it's tried to get around the Constitution and the reason the LUC comes into play is because the county has said, your use was always unlawful. And it was unlawful as a matter of state law. And it was unlawful as a matter of state law on June 5th, 1976, when the, the state adopted the definition of farm dwelling. That's the reason the county picked that date, is to say, this use that we're now no longer allowing you to engage in was actually illegal 43 years before we got around to telling you you couldn't engage in. And so the county is using state law to justify the retroaf retroactive application of a change in county zoning. That's the issue and that's why we're be before the LUC. And, and, and to the point of, of whether other counties do this, no. I have not seen any other county reach back in time and say that, it, that our law does not grandfather you in. You do not get to continue this use that you were engaged in because for 43 years, it was illegal as a matter of state law. While all the counties have different regulations of the agricultural district to some extent, nobody that I've ever seen or ever worked on has reached back in time the way the county of Hawaii has done that. And so that takes us to why we're here. What is the question before the commission? The question before the commission is quite simply whether as of June 5th, 1976, chapter 205 regulated the duration of rentals of a farm dwelling, whether it regulated how long a farm dwelling had to be rented to be a farm dwelling. Did it impose a minimum rental period? That's the question and that's the question because as I said, that's the date that the county is relying on. This is not a factual question other than the fact of the ordinance and what the ordinance says. That matters very much. We, we haven't heard in detail what it says. We've heard labels and I'll talk about that too. But what the ordinance says matters very, very much. The other facts do not. The, the ultimate question is one of law and all of the briefs as you've seen and the bulk of the argument that you've heard today focuses on that uh, law. And so, so uh, although uh, Commissioner Ohigashi has left, I, I will uh, respond to a point that he made. And, and, and if, if there are further questions later, I'm happy to elaborate. But he referenced H.A.R. 1515-23. That was adopted in 1986. So it was adopted 10 years after the, the date that the county relies on. And, and so it's not something that is relevant to the question that is before the committee. The county chose the date. The county chose June 5th, 1976 as its trigger date. And so anything that happened in the law after that doesn't matter. The, the rule that Commissioner Ohigashi cited wouldn't matter for other reasons too, but, but we don't need to get into them because it's obviously after the date that the county, uh, the county has selected. Um, the, the question that's before the LUC is not one that, that asks the, the LUC to declare the county law invalid, right? That's not something that the commission could do and we certainly haven't asked the commission to do that. Um, it's quite simply, what was the law for this specific use, farm dwelling, as of a particular date? So, so let's turn to that <clears throat> and what this case is actually about, which is legal definitions. The details matter, and in the, this case, this declaratory case, the details are the definitions. And so the, the effective April 1, 2019, the county prohibited what it's labeled as short-term vacation rentals on lots created on or after June 5th, 1976. Not a prospective regulation, again, a retroactive regulation. This definition of what the county <clears throat> has labeled short-term vacation rentals has three parts. The, the first part is that the owner doesn't reside there. 
The second part is that the dwelling doesn't have more than five bedrooms to rent. And the third is that the dwelling is rented for a period of 31 days. That's, that's what makes a, a use a short-term vacation rental in the county's mind, just those three factors, nothing else, nothing considering, as we will see, how the property is actually used. The, the, as I said, the county picked June 5th, 1976, because that's the date that the, uh, the legislature uh, enacted or, or it was effective, uh, uh, put into place the definition of farm dwelling. That's when it was added to chapter 205. And according to the county, since that date, chapter 205 has prohibited rentals of less than 31 days. Now, in your discussions with both the county and the Office of Planning, there were a lot of inconsistent things said. Both of them at different times said that, oh sure, a rental of less than 31 days would be okay as long as it's connected to agricultural activity. That would be fine. But that, with that concession, the case is over. That's the only question to answer by the Land Use Commission is, is did the law on that date prohibit rentals of 31 days? Both have said no, as long as it's connected to agricultural activity. Now the county later said yes, it would still be illegal, but it's not an accurate portrayal of law and it's inconsistent with statements that were earlier made. Uh, and so that's really what this case is about. And, and just to, to touch on the OP's brief point about, is that a question the LUC can address? Absolutely, as every party has conceded to Commissioner Chang's questions, the LUC has jurisdiction to interpret and apply the law. We've asked for that, the county has asked for that. The fact, as I've said, is what the county ordinance says. And certainly the, the LUC can interpret the law as it applies to that fact. Let me talk a little bit about what this case is not about. And, and you've heard a lot about what it's not about already from the other parties, but it's not about labels, right? Anyone can label any use any way they want to. And here, as you heard from, from the county today, uh, quite strongly, farm dwelling and short-term vacation rental by their terms, <clears throat> by their labels, are simply incompatible. They can't coexist. Well, but a label doesn't matter. The question is, how do you define it? And as we set out in our papers, all the counties and the state define short-term different ways. On Oahu, short-term is less than 30 days. On Maui, it's less than 180 days. On Kauai, it's less than 181 days. As we've seen on the Big Island, it's now less than 31 days. That, that, that short-term is just a label. It, what matters is how it's defined. Right, that's the key part, not, not what you call it. And so we put in our, our papers an, an easy example of that. The county could, could label wind farms as power plants. They generate power from a specific location. We regulate power plants and we don't allow them on agricultural land. They're not allowed under chapter 205. The commission wouldn't stop at the label. Well, you're right, power plants aren't allowed, so you lose. The commission would look at the substance. Well, okay, how does the county define power plants. And if you looked at the definition and saw that a power plant to the county is simply a wind farm, then you would say, no, that, that use is allowed under chapter 205. It's right there. And you would say on a case by case basis, we can determine what a wind farm is. In the same way, you can't look at the label vacation rental and farm dwelling. You have to actually look at how those terms are defined. You also have to consider that you're interpreting and applying state law, so statewide, right? So what you do, how you interpret chapter 205 is the same for every county. What you say 205 means is the same for every county. It doesn't turn on each county's individual definition of short-term rental. You don't say that chapter 205 means this on the Big Island because they define it as 31 days, but it means this on Oahu because they define it as 30 days. And it means this on Kauai because it's 180 days and something different on Maui because it's 181. I back, I've got those backwards. Kauai is 181, Maui is 180. You wouldn't have different definitions of farm dwelling for each county. You have one definition because you're the state land use commission and you're interpreting and applying chapter 205, which is a state law. And so, so the White Supreme Court, as we put out in our, our papers, has been quite clear. The titles don't matter. What you title an ordinance or in their case a statute doesn't matter. What you label something doesn't matter. It's the substance 
that is important. And so we need to look at the substance of what the county is regulating and not what the county has called it to determine the right answer in this case. The second thing that this is not about is specific uses. So what individuals are doing on their property, how individuals are using their property. And, and it's not about specific cases because the question before the LUC is one of interpretation of, an, of a law, right? It's a legal question interpreting a, a law that arises only because of the factual circumstance of what the county has done, not because of any individual use. So to, to Dr. Bell earlier, any, any individual use might not be a farm dwelling under state law because of how the property is used. If it's not used in connection with the farm or doesn't provide income to the family occupying, the farm doesn't provide income to uh, uh, the family occupying the dwelling, it wouldn't be a farm dwelling. But that's a question of enforcement, not a question of interpretation. We're here on a question of interpretation, not a question of enforcement, not dealing with specific uses, whether they're petitioners or Mr. Bell's. Those aren't the questions that are before, before, the, before the body. The last thing this case is not about, and it, it harkens back to my first point, and that is it's not about vacation rentals. No one is asking the commission to say vacation rentals, however they might be defined, and I use that term generically because as we've seen, the definitions vary. No one is asking the commission to say that vacation rentals are allowed on state ag land. Certainly not to, to get to the specific part of the question, not to say that as of June 5th, 1976, vacation rentals were allowed on state ag land. That is not the question before the commission. To be sure, as I've said, the county and to some extent OP have tried to make that the question, but it's not. Again, that's just a label. And unless you dig into the definitions, you don't know what that label means. And so what we've seen today is that term vacation rental actually defined additional ways that have nothing to do with the, the, either the ordinance or chapter 205. Uh, uh, the way Ms. Apuna described vacation rental, that's not what the county ordinance says. There's nothing, those words aren't found in the county's definition of short-term vacation rental. It was the same thing for the county. The way the county described it when it departed from the code, those words aren't in the county code. That's not how the county defines a short-term vacation rental. Those are, those are hypothetical speculations about how a property is used or what's occurring on the property. They're not the definition. And because they're not the definition, they're not the things that are actually before the LUC today. They, they, they don't matter. And so it's not about vacation rentals. It is about definitions. Those matter. So let's take those definitions and really look at them piece by piece and see what state law was as of June 5th, 1976. So as I said, there are three parts to the county's definition, three things really that make a dwelling a short-term vacation rental. The first is that the owner does not occupy the dwelling. The second is that the dwelling has five or fewer bedrooms. And the third is that a tenant occupies the dwelling for less than 31 days. That's it. Then it's a short-term rental, nothing more. Nothing about how the property is being used, just those factors. So let's take them one at a time. First one, the owner does not occupy the dwelling. So then we ask, does chapter 205, as of June 5th, 1976, require that the owner occupy the dwelling to make it a farm dwelling? And we see that the, the answer is no. The answer is clearly no. Uh, there's nothing in the, in the state statute that requires it. And indeed, OP does not argue to the contrary. And further indeed, today the county conceded that yes, an owner does not need to occupy the dwelling for it to be a farm dwelling. It can be rented. And, and that's what state statute expressly says, right? The state statute as of that date expressly contemplates leases. Leases are the same thing as a rental and nobody argues otherwise. Okay, so the first part of the county's definition of short-term vacation rental is not inconsistent with a farm dwelling. The owner does not have to occupy it. So we move on to the second part. The second part is the number of bedrooms. 
the county defines a short-term vacation rental as having five or fewer bedrooms to rent. And so we, we go through the same exercise. We look at the state definition of farm dwelling, and we ask ourselves, okay, well, does the state definition as it existed on June 5th, 1976 care how many bedrooms a farm dwelling has? No, it doesn't. There's nothing in the state definition that cares one way or another. It could have one bedroom, it could have six bedrooms. It doesn't matter for purposes of the state definition. So again, we look and we say, okay, the way the county has defined short-term vacation rentals, at least as to bedrooms, is not inconsistent with a farm dwelling. You can have a farm dwelling with fewer than five bedrooms. So we're okay so far. They line up, there's no conflict. So we come to the last part, the duration of the rental. And as you can see, as we put up on the screen, the county defines short term as a period of, of 30 consecutive days or less. Again, different from all the other counties, but prospectively, no problem. The county can define things however it wants to. Since the county is trying to do this retroactively, we have to look and say, okay, how did the state define short term or did, how did the state define farm dwelling? Did it impose an, a, minimum, a, a, a minimum rental period? Eschewing labels, eschewing generalities, looking at what the statute actually says. And, and in their papers, the county and OP took the position that in all circumstances, in all ways, you could never have a rental of a farm dwelling less than 31 days and still be a farm dwelling. Under questioning by the, count, by the commission today, both caved on that point. Both acknowledge there are circumstances in which you could have a rental of less than 31 days and it still be a farm dwelling as a matter of state law. That, again, is the end of the discussion. That's the entirety of the petition for declaratory re relief. The answer is no. State law did not regulate or prescribe a minimum rental period. And, and, and we can see quite clearly for three reasons that that's the right answer. The first is that the statute does not expressly set a durational minimum. It just doesn't. We have up on the screen concessions from OP's brief, but you heard it again today. There's nothing in the statute that sets a minimum period. And if we look at the, at the definition, the approach the state has taken is to focus on use, how that dwelling is used. That's the difference between a single family dwelling and a farm dwelling as a matter of state law, not how long a particular occupant uses it, but how the dwelling is used. And that's the difference structurally between how the county approached short-term vacation rentals and how the state approached farm dwellings. When we look at the county's definition, we see that the word vacation doesn't appear anywhere except in the title, right? Except in the definition itself. The county definition does not look at the use, does not ask, is the person staying there for less than 31 days on vacation? Or are they a tenant farmer? or are they a resident, or are they doing something else? The county's definition doesn't care how the property is used, it just cares how long it's used. The state definition is completely the opposite. It does not care how long it's used, it cares expressly how it's used. And so there is no durational limitation in the state statute. A farm dwelling is simply a single family dwelling. A single family dwelling describes the type of structure. It's one living unit. That one living unit must be used in one of two alternative ways. The first is located on and used in connection with the farm. The second is that the family occupying the dwelling, the family using the dwelling, must derive income from an agricultural activity. That's it, focused entirely on the use. The, the, the dwelling located on and used in connection with the farm or the family occupying the dwelling and receiving agricultural income could be there for a month, a year, 10 years, 100 years, if we could live so long, and it wouldn't matter. The statute doesn't care about the use. The, the interpretation rules, as we've set out in our papers and you see some of on the screen, tell us quite clearly that when the text is plain, we're bound by the text. The discussion ends. The statute said what it said on June 5th, 1976. That's the end of the discussion. To get around that, to get around the plain language, the OP 
and the county rely on implication. They acknowledge, okay, it doesn't actually say that. But we're going to imply a minimum rental period. And today you heard it all over the map. You know, it, it actually might not be a minimum period depending on how it's used. Well, the county code says a minimum rental period. And they, they justify that by implication, not by expression. Two issues with that, of course. The first is you can't simply add words to a statute that aren't there. You can't, can't make a statute do more than it does. That's just not sound construction or any defensible construction. The second is because we're dealing with a zoning law, because we're dealing with something that restricts or limits the use of property, it's a zoning law. And because it's a zoning law, the, the court RRC, ICA, and I'm, we put it in our papers and it's up on the screen, has expressly held you can't extend the restrictions by implication. They're either expressly in there or they're not. And that's the end of the discussion. And, and the third reason that the, the, the plain language of the statute controls and, the, and that the right answer is the plain language of the statute did not regulate minimum rental periods is because a contrary reading leads to an absurd result. You would have to say, that it, at all times and in all ways, chapter 205 on June 5th, 1976, prohibited the rental of any farm dwelling for less than 31 days. If you go down that path, then you lead to an absurd result, as we will see. If you go down the correct analytical path, which is to say it did not, June 5th, 1976, did not prescribe a minimum rental period, you end up with a very clean analysis. We've illustrated that analysis through the magic of PowerPoint. You start with a, a fact of a single family dwelling. You have one, okay. You, you're on the right track toward a farm dwelling. The second question is, is it used in connection with a farm? If that answer is yes, that's the end of the discussion. The use was lawful on June 5th, 1976. You get to the third consideration you have a month to month lease for any of the reasons set out in the landlord or tenant code. And, and by the way, that's an important consideration here is the landlord tenant code expressly authorizes leases of any terms. And in two circumstances makes leases month to month. The first is if you don't have a written lease, it's automatically a month to month lease. The second is if your rental term ends, the state law, the landlord tenant code converts it into a month to month lease. And so in this situation, we have something like that. You have a single family dwelling. It's used in connection to the farm. You have a month to month lease for any of the good reasons the state landlord tenant says, code says you can, no problem. It's still a farm dwelling. If we look at the, the alternative language of the definition of farm dwelling, we get to the same outcome. You have a single family dwelling. Agricultural activity provides income to the family occupying the dwelling. You have a month to month lease for any of the many reasons that, that state law says you can, no problem. It's still a farm dwelling because you've met the definition in chapter 205. And this will be true for all counties, right? It's state law, it's a uniform ruling. It applies in all counties, regardless of how they define short term. But if you go down the county's rabbit hole and start introducing duration as relevant to the state definition, you end up at an absurd result. You take the same basic facts. You have a single family dwelling. It's used in connection with the farm. And if you stop there, chapter 205 says that's a farm dwelling all day long. That's all chapter 205 looks at. You introduce a month to month lease. And now the county and OP would say, that's not a farm dwelling anymore. That's suddenly become a short term vacation rental because we, the county, chose to define it that way. Again, we heard different things today, but this is what their written arguments were. Mr. Chip Chase? Yes. It's been about a half hour. In fact, exactly a half hour. So about how much more do you have right now? Five minutes, Chair. Great, thank you. Ish. Uh, but I, 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 I promise to be as fast. I'll, I'll stick to five. Tell me when I'm up. Um, the The, that result would only hold on the Big Island because on Oahu, we define short-term rental as 30 days or less. So on Oahu, it would still be okay as a matter of state law, the Big Island not. You, you can't have that kind of absurd result. And you see the same thing if we look at the alternative definition, if we say 
uh, a single family dwelling here, the agricultural activity provides income. But again, because it's a month to month lease, the county would say all of a sudden, you don't have a farm dwelling, at least for purposes of the big island. It's an absurd result. You can't have that outcome because that's not what the statute says. And you can't have an outcome that is different retroactively in different counties. Going forward, the county could say, we have a minimum rental period. Okay, right? That's a, that's a case for another day. The question here is going backwards. Could it do that? Um, the, the question then, the issue to come back to, putting absurd outcomes aside, is as of June 5th, 1976, did Chapter 205 regulate the minimum duration of rentals? And, and the answer, according to the statute, is no. That's not a fact-specific question. It doesn't depend upon what the county calls a short-term rental. It doesn't depend upon what any other county calls a short-term rental. It's not dependent upon a specific use of a particular property because those facts are not before the commission. It's simply an in question of interpretation. Enforcement, making sure that the lands are used appropriately is a case by case basis. It's, it's not a question of policy, right? This isn't a question of whether short-term vacation rentals are good or bad. That's not a question the LUC can wade into. The LUC can interpret its statute and the interpretation of its statute on that date is clear. What OP and the county would have you do is legislate. They would have you expand the definition of farm dwelling to include terms that are not in it. This is what, as we put up on the screen, what the statute would have to say for you to agree with the county and OP's position. It simply did not say that on June 5th, 1976, and it doesn't say that today. This body can interpret the law. This body can't add words to the law, can't expand its restriction and make it something other than it is. This is true even if we feel like the legislature wanted to do something different, wanted to be more restrictive, wanted to adopt or would adopt a particular provision. It doesn't matter. When the text is clear, we stop. And that's as true for the LUC as it is for courts. And so in, in conclusion, and I think I made my five minutes chair, I hope, uh, it's not a question of whether rentals are good or bad or the short-term vacation rentals, however you define them, are good or bad. It's not about a particular use, whether a particular use is lawful as a short-term rental or as something else. It's a question of statutory interpretation. We can't rewrite the statutes. We can't say whether they're good or bad. We have to apply the law as written. No one says that law is ambiguous. Unambiguously, the law as written did not regulate the duration of rentals. So, so in response to this consolidated proceeding, the correct outcome chair and commissioners is to grant the Rose Hill petition and deny the county's petition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chase. And yes, that was under five minutes, that last part. Um, commissioners, I want to do a temperature check. Do you want a break before we get into what I'm sure will be extensive discussions with Mr. Chip Chase? I would like that, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Wong is suggesting a break's in order. It is 2.14. If we can reassemble in 10 minutes at 2.24, then we'll get into questioning. Thank you. We're in recess. Thanks. Okay, we have Commissioner Cabral and Hilo, Commissioners Wong and Scheuer, Commissioner Okuda, Commissioner Chang, Commissioner Axon, Commissioner Ohigashi rejoined us towards the end of Cal Chip Chase's presentation. Um, that gives us six, seven commissioners. And we have the county and we have Mr. Chip Chase uh, office planning. Yeah, okay, there you are. Great. Checking, checking with the uh, court room. Let's see, just to double check. I mean, Gene. And court reporter, you can hear us? I can hear you, thank you. Great, okay. 
Um, it is 2.25. We are back on the record. Um, I think I, I slightly misspoke because perhaps I didn't interpret it or think about the way the day was going well enough. We actually have four possibilities in front of us today. We can deny the petitions. We can accept, obviously, one or deny the other. Um, we can accept them, we can send the matter to hearing, or we can actually continue this hearing. Um, our, I'm advised by Mr. Derrickson that the 90-day deadline for making decisions from the hearing date is August 17th. We are scheduled to be in Hilo in July, late July. It is possible that if we are not able to make a decision today, um, or are disinclined to make a decision today, we could indicate our desire to continue these proceedings. I would note that for, um, because of Mr. Ohigashi's required absence, that if we did continue the proceedings, that would give him the opportunity to review the transcript um, of the small portion that he missed and be eligible quite clearly to fully deliberate and decision, make decisions on this matter. So procedurally, that's where we're at, but we have at least a little more time and attention that we can pay to this now. And I wanna open it up for questions from the commissioners for Mr. Chip Chase. Uh, Chair. Commissioner Wong. First, this is more a procedural uh, question that's following up on you. So if we, uh, let Commissioner Ohigashi, we, we push it down the road and let Commissioner Ohigashi review the transcripts. Can we ask all parties to provide more information d d before the next hearing? Um, I believe that's the case, but I'll actually ask Ms. Chow to just opine. We could direct the parties for additional briefs. Um, I believe so, yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wong. Commissioners, questions for Mr. Chip Chase. Commissioner Okuda. Commissioner Okuda followed by Commissioner Cabral. Uh, thank you, Chair. I volunteered since nobody seemed to initially volunteer. Uh, Mr. Chip Chase, if I understand your presentation correctly, um, you, you are viewing whether or not a dwelling is authorized or okay based on its use. Is that correct? The use as described in Chapter 205. Right, as described in Chapter 205. And specifically, it's 205-4.5. Is that correct? Uh, I, I don't recall if that was the specific statutory enumeration on July or June 5th, 1976, uh, but I'm sure we're talking about the same provision, the definition of farm dwelling. Okay. And with respect to the definition of what uh, is a permitted or permissible farm dwelling, you uh, explained to us it's basically a uh, two element test or two evaluation test, or you look for one of two things. Is that correct? That is correct. One thing is whether or not the dwelling is used in connection with the farm, or number two, whether or not the agricultural activity provides income for the occupant of the dwelling. Is that correct? True. They're clearly alternatives. Okay. So, uh, if I were to uh, tell you, and let's say you were the County of Hawaii uh, permitting official, and I told you, Mr. Chip Chase, I have a parcel of property that is within the agricultural district, and I'm telling you this under oath, in fact, I'm giving you a written statement under oath, and I'm telling you to your face, I want to build a dwelling, but number one, I'm not going to use it in connection with a farm. There will be absolutely no agriculture taking place on the property. And number two, 
I'm a retiree, so I get my uh, income from uh, my retirement, which is unconnected to any agricultural activity. And I'm telling you, I've worked long and hard enough in my life, and so I don't intend to get any income from any agricultural activity. Would that initial dwelling be lawful under uh, HRS section 205-4.5 as a farm dwelling? If you'll give me a little bit of room, I'd like to answer your very clear yes or no question with a bit of a longer explanation. And then if, if you're not happy about that, then, then I'll, I'll come back and try to be more direct, but, but hopefully understand why I, I take a more circuitous route. Uh, and it's not simply because the idea of putting on the county's hat is so antithetical to me. I'm not sure how to do that, but, but that's not the reason. It's, it's, it's actually that the question is complicated by two factors. The first is that uh, the county, as we heard today, would require uh, the proponent of the building permit to sign that farm dwelling affidavit. And so if, if they refuse to sign that, effectively making the representations that you've stated, then, uh, then I presume the county would deny the building permit because they refused to sign the, the, the document. Now, if they signed the document and made that statement, we heard the county say they would still grant the building permit, right? Because they signed the document and they don't care that the owner has said it's, it's not gonna be used for agriculture. So let me come then to the second part of your question, which is really not so much focused on whether the, the structure is lawful because under the, the state law, uh, a, a farm dwelling is a single family dwelling. We describe that as a single unit, a unit for one family. So the, the structure could be perfectly lawful, but it's the use. And to get to what I, I think you're really asking is the use. And if the use doesn't meet either part of that definition, then under state law, it's not a farm dwelling and therefore would not be allowed as a matter of state law. So if, if the only thing you had in front of you to make the decision as the uh, permitting officer, the only thing you had was the statute, HRS section 205-4.5. And I told you those things, which is number one, I don't intend to use this dwelling that I want to construct uh, in connection with a farm. And number two, I'm not gonna get any income from agricultural activity. Would my use of that dwelling be permitted or lawful under that statute? No. I take your answer to be no. Correct. Okay, okay. Um, let me ask you this, uh, switching uh, gears just slightly. You raise certain constitutional issues about vested rights. But isn't it true that a right is vested and protected by the Constitution, federal and state, only if the, the use that you're attempting to vest was lawful at the time? Absolutely, which is why the date is so critical, right? Because the county has said as of June 5th, 1976, this use was unlawful a rental of less than 31 days, right? Issuing labels, that's what it's about, a rental of less than 31 days. And unless you declare as a matter of state law for all counties that as of that date, the code or the, the statute prohibited a rental of less than 31 days, then the use was lawful on that date and vested rights would apply. Okay, but rights are vested only if it's lawfully uh, exercise rights, correct? True. I mean, there's no, okay. And, and my final question goes to that case that I cited earlier, Save Sunset Beach uh, Coalition versus City and County of Honolulu. That was a 102 Hawaii Reports 465, and specifically at the quotation that I read at 487. Um, did you consider the quotation I read to be an accurate statement of the law? I, other than I agree with Commissioner Scheuer that there wasn't a typo, but other than that, I, I absolutely agree that's a correct statement of the law. Yeah, and uh, going back and rereading the case, I think both you and uh, uh, Dr. Scheuer are correct that uh, I was mistaken that there was a typo. So do you agree that, in fact, um, 
you could have a situation where the county zoning requirements may be actually stricter than the state requirements and the county stricter requirements should be enforced. That's yes. a possible scenario. Prospectively, absolutely. From And you see that in different county ordinances. If we look at the different counties regulation of ag land, you do see differences that are stricter in some cases by requiring additional permits. I've never seen a county disallow a use that is expressly allowed by statute. I don't think you could do that, but I think you can, you can allow or you can require additional permitting or approvals by the county to make a use lawful that the state would say is lawful as a matter of right. But again, only prospectively. I do not agree that the county could retroactively say, we, in our case, believe that short-term rentals, rentals of less than 31 days are inappropriate for agricultural land. I don't agree that they could apply that as of June 5th, 1976. I agree they could have applied it as of April 1, 2019 forward. Okay, just so that I'm clear, what uh, case do you cite to which so holds? Just so that we're really clear about the authority on which you base that statement. For the, the, the retroactive regulation of land use is illegal? Yes. Uh, it, it's extensive in our briefing, and if you give Mr. Gooden uh, a couple of minutes, he will come up with the citation and, and we will be back to you. Oh, oh, no, no. As long as if it's in your brief, I, I read through that. And uh, uh, let, let me ask you then, then this. Uh, what's the difference then between what you are stating as far as the uh, unconstitutionality of what you're describing as uh, retroactive regulation and uh, the rule that I think the, I, I, and you, you did put one of the cases up uh, on, on the PowerPoint, but I was looking at a more recent case, which is uh, Leone, that's L-E-O-N-E -E versus uh, City of Maui, or I'm sorry, County of Maui, that's 129 Hawaii, I'm sorry, 128 Hawaii, 183, that's a 212 uh, Intermediate Court of Appeals case, where it seemed like the test really was number one, has the regulatory agency taken away all economic value of the property, or number two, was there a physical invasion of the property, no matter how minimal that invasion was. I mean, isn't that the controlling case and not the cases that you cited? Uh, no, Commissioner, not, not even close, actually. So the Leone case and the, the test that you articulated is a takings case. So in regulatory takings parlance, you have a taking of property if the regulation denies all economically viable use or has such an economic impact, interferes with distinct investment-backed expectations and lacks sufficient justification that we call it a taking anyway. So you've got total takings and partial takings. Uh, and then you also have physical takings. And all of that comes to us from three US Supreme Court cases, Lucas against South Carolina Coastal Commission, which dealt with total takings, uh, Penn Central Transportation Company from the 70s that dealt with partial takings, regulations that leave some economically viable use but still go too far, uh, in the words of, of an older case. Uh, and physical takings, which comes from Loretto Teleprompter. We also had a case here, Kaiser Aetna, which involved a physical invasion. That's one protection under the Fifth Amendment, the takings clause. Entirely separate from the, the Fifth Amendment's protections as takings are the due process protections, which are found both in the 15th and the 14th Amendment, as well as the Hawaii Constitution and the prohibition on retroactively applying a land use regulation is a due process violation, not a takings violation. Okay, so you are not arguing a takings violation in this uh, matter before us, correct? Uh, that, that's true. And, and in fact, I'm, I'm not even asking the, the commission to rule the county ordinance unconstitutional. That's not your purview. And that's not my point. My point is that the county's retroactive regulation saying on April 19th, 2019, or April 1st, 2019, rentals of less than 31 days were unlawful as of June 5th, 1976, that backwards reach is blatantly unconstitutional. 
but the county tries to defend it by saying on that date, state law didn't allow the use anyway. And that's why it's so critical that we focus on what the state law said as of June 5th, 1976. Because if the state law did not say that you cannot rent a farm dwelling for less than 31 days, then this, the county cannot reach back in time and declare those uses illegal. It can only do that going forward. And my final question to you, Mr. Chip Chase, is what is the harm to you or what response would you have to a suggestion that maybe we should just deny both petitions because these petitions seem to raise issues which possibly are beyond the scope of our authority? I, 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 harm in the sense of, of, of wasted time, of course, would, would be one, but, but I don't mean that, I don't mean that in, in any sense of frustration. What I, would, what I would say is that to me, that would be an inappropriate result because the question to the LUC is quite clearly within your jurisdiction. You have the jurisdiction to interpret and apply chapter 205. It's, it's in your rules and it's part of your responsibility. You, you do that in this form, in this declaratory petition form. And as the chair explained at the beginning, on these kinds of petitions, the facts may be very limited. And these aren't factual questions that are presented to you. There aren't factual findings. There aren't witnesses in the sense of evidence mattering. It's not a contested case. It's a legal question. And, and this body absolutely has the, the jurisdiction and the responsibility to interpret chapter 205 uh, uh, pursuant to these, to these petitions. And so I believe they're properly brought and that it would be improper to refuse to decide them. Well, um, just a slight segue, and I promise this absolutely will be my last question. But, but don't you think that uh, the response of the county as far as how it is applying uh, uh, 205 dash um, 4.5 as far as what it considers a uh, farm dwelling that you know, they possibly do not follow your two prong evaluation test that now raises questions about even maybe whether or not they've made a, a rational distinction or a proper distinction between applications of the, of their, um, for the lack of better term, their vacation rental ordinance and the way they're handling general permits. And maybe this is something you all should flesh out in a full-on uh, proceeding in circuit court and take it up with the appellate courts after that. And, and so, Commissioner, I, I appreciate that, that question, I, and I think it's, it's, um, it's thoughtful. It, what I would say in, in response to that is, is two things. One, that there may be a time and a place for litigation over this or over questions, and, and the ones you've raised are questions for a court, not, not for the LUC to decide. Uh, but, but that's not what's before this body. And, and guessing about what other litigation may ensue or what other questions should be answered is really outside the purview of the petitions. The LUC, in my view, uh, respectfully, should stick to the petitions that are before it and answer the, the narrow questions that are before it. The other part that I would, I would advocate uh, 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 for is that we try to avoid constitutional questions generally in the legal system if we can. If we can interpret the law in such a way as to avoid a constitutional question or a constitutional crisis, we do that. Here, there's obviously an opportunity to avoid the constitutional question by declaring what the law was on June 5th, 1976, the, the plain meaning of farm dwelling. And, and uh, the LUC, if it exercises that responsibility and makes that declaration has an opportunity potentially to avoid litigation of the kind that you've mentioned. Okay, thank you very much. Thank You're you, welcome. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Commissioner Okuda. Commissioner Chang, followed by Commissioner Cabral. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chip Chase, um, you are a very, um, I appreciate your arguments, let me put it that way. I always appreciate your arguments. Um, so I would, I would agree with you that the question is properly before the Land Use Commission. And I, and I agree with you that it is really a very limited question of 
the definition of farm dwelling. And, and, I, um, and would you agree with, and I would also agree that the definition of farm dwelling has nothing to do with the duration. So, um, but would you agree that while the county cannot say that it was unlawful under state law back in 1976, the Land Use Commission through the definition of farm dwelling could say that it was unlawful going back to 1976. You, you could interpret the law and if your interpretation of the law was to say this use, this duration was not allowed as of a certain date, right? That would not be retrospective. You're declaring it as of a certain date in response to the petitions. And so uh, in, in the same way that, that I, I agree with you that the, uh, the commission has the power to declare that the definition of farm dwelling has nothing to do with duration. The commission could in response say uh, the opposite, if it could ground it textually in the statute and say it does have to do with duration. With respect, I would disagree because it's not in there, but in terms of your power, absolutely. What, what you couldn't do, I think, is reach out and declare that short-term vacation rentals aren't lawful in the agricultural district because that is a label that is subject to multiple definitions. All, all we have before us is the county's definition. Right. And we've been through the parts of that. And the only one that we come down to fighting about uh, with the county is the duration. And so with respect, I would say that is the only question before you. Yeah. And I guess for me, I don't even have to address the question of duration. I don't even think that that is relevant before us to determine um, what is the definition of farm dwelling. And could you, would you also agree that the county cannot be more liberal in its interpretation of state law? While it can be more conservative and restrictive, it cannot be more liberal. Yes. Okay. And would you also agree that when, that under statutory construction, it is, it is appropriate under the principle of pari materia to construe the statute in the context of, um, of each other. So I look at 205-2, 2D in particular. Districting and classification of lands. And it specifically, D talks about agricultural districts. It really looks at describing um, the types of, of districts. It goes from urban, rural, agricultural, and conservation. And un under the, the description of agricultural districts, it says um, agricultural districts shall include activities or uses as characterized by the cultivation of crops, orchards, forage, and forestry, farming activities, or uses related to animal hus husbandry, aquaculture, and game and fish propagation. I mean, you can read this on your own, but it's clearly, it's related to some kind of agricultural use. So when I look at, you know, the overarching framework of, of um, the appropriate uses under these various districts, and then I look at the definition of 205, 4.5, and everybody agrees that LUC has the authority to interpret that statute. And so when I look at farm dwelling, it says farm dwellings, employee housing, farm buildings, or activity or uses related to farming and animal husbandry. And then it defines, it describes farm dwellings as used in this paragraph means, so that when I apply the rules of statutory construction, it is clear in my mind that farm dwellings relates to farming or um, uh, agricultural activities, agricultural activities that are consistent with the overarching um, principles or, or purposes of, of the districting, of the various districts. 
So um, while we may disagree on the definition of farm dwelling, what I hear from you is that one, the Land Use Commission is, has the jurisdiction to, dis, to, um, uh, to define farm dwelling, to define the state statute. The Land Use Commission can go back to look at 1976 and what was the intent, what was the legislative intent of that definition and we could apply statutory construction to look at the overarching um, principles of these, of these various districts. But the Land Use Commission has the authority to make that, that determination. And that's totally separate and apart from the county, any of the counties, because as you've described, they all have different definitions of of uh, vacation rentals. And in my mind, we don't even get, I didn't even get to vacation rentals. I am at the point of just defining farm dwellings. And, um, you know, there may be an issue with the county, but you, you agree that it is Land Use Commission's authority. And, and you described it very clearly that that is the issue here. And as, Ms., as Commissioner Okuda was asking questions, you felt there was enough for the Land Use Commission to make that, that, um, that determination. I just want to confirm that with you. Yeah, and uh, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the thoroughness of, of the question, the different parts. Uh, I think I would have to say, at least insofar as I understand you, uh, I, and, and if I don't, it's totally my fault, that I agree in part and disagree in part. Uh, and so if I may break that down and try to take, um, take it in, into parts that, that help us uh, work through this. The, the, the first question is, is looking at other parts of the statute, right, in, in paramateria. Uh, obviously, that is an element of statutory construction, but I would say two things about it. One, looking at the different parts of the statute only matters if you're looking at the laws that existed on June 5th, 1976. If you're looking at the law after June 5th, 1976, then no, that's not construing a statute in paramateria. That's, that's subsequent legislative history. And that is a particularly inappropriate uh, consideration or, or basis for decision in this case. You'd have to look at the law as it existed on the date that is relevant. And the county selected the relevant date, right? If the county had selected today, then you'd look at the law as it exists today. The county selected June 5th, 1976. And so we look at the date that the, chose, the county has chosen and you only look at the law as it existed on that date. Uh, the second thing that I would say is that when you're construing a statute a, as a whole, uh, that's, that's appropriate, but you have to apply all the rules of statutory construction, not just some of them. And among the rules that you apply are that when you're faced with general statements and specific statements, the specific statements control. So a general statement of policy or what we believe to be appropriate uses is, is a general statement. It doesn't control over the specific enumerated uh, elements or activities that state law allows. For example, somebody couldn't come in and say, I can do this because it's generally involving what, what is generally described in 205.2, but is not specifically listed in 205.4.5. And so you never let the general control over the specific. And I would say further, when you are looking at the specific, you look at how those terms are defined. And if they're defined in the statute, then you are bound by that definition, right? You can't expand a statutory definition. If a term is not defined, you can apply the plain language of it. And that's set out in our interpretive statutes, section one dash, et cetera. Uh, but you have, to, you have to start with and stick to the statutory definition. And the, oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, I was going to finish, but I'm happy to take a break and respond to you. Okay. So are you saying that 205-2D was not in existence in 1976? Oh, no, no. I, I'm simply cautioning that I don't know whether you were reading from the version as it existed on June 5th, 1976, or a more recent version uh, of the statute. And so I, I just don't know one way or another. And so I was just cautioning that we have to read the statute that it existed on the relevant date. That's sure. all. Okay, and, and you would agree that um, you have to make sure, I mean, part of the principle between pari materia 
is to ensure uniformity and consistency in the application and interpretation of the statute. Right? I, I don't know if that's specifically part of in paramateria. It's, it's more that, uh, that, that um, you're construing things as a whole, but that takes me to a, another rule of statutory construction that I want to make sure we, we all understand. And is that is you can't, you can't read one part of a statute to contradict or invalidate another part of the statute. So if a statute, in our case, we don't have to deal with hypotheticals, we're dealing with farm dwellings. If, if the statute says, this is a farm dwelling, then that is a farm dwelling. There's nothing else in the statute that can alter or change that. And, and more to, to our discussion, I think, the Land Use Commission doesn't have the power to change that. You can't change that definition in any way. You can't add to it. You can't extract, detract from it. You can't modify it. it. It is what it is. It says what it says. You have the power to declare that. But in declaring it, it doesn't give you the power to expand or to change it. Um, and I think that that's a, a, particularly, a, a particular focus uh, in, in this case, because nor does the Land Use Commission have the power to declare something that was not presented to it in the petition. In other words, you don't have the power to reach out beyond the petition and answer a question you'd like to answer rather than the question that's before you. You can't- what would, Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I keep no, on- No, no, go ahead. I mean, what is the question that's not before us that I'm raising? I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I, got a little, I got a little concerned about that when you said that the duration doesn't matter, we don't have to get to duration, when duration is the thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. No, but it isn't the only thing that matters for Land Use Commission, because you're right. We, we interpret the statute 205.4.5. And there's right. nothing in 205.4.5.4 that says duration. Right. You're only defining farm dwelling. And, and so that would be that would be an appropriate declaration, right? right. That okay. is a statement from the LUC. And so so we're we're on the same page there. Okay. okay. And then the last point that I wanted to make, and then I'm happy to 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 follow up with you or any other questions you have, of course, is that um, uh, the while you are looking for legislative intent, it's important that the, the starting point for legislative intent is the text. And mm -hmm. if the text is unambiguous, we stop there. Uh, we don't look elsewhere for intent because intent is, is presented to us in the form of text. Uh, and so we cited a number of cases for that proposition, Hawaii Supreme Court cases in our papers. I, I could go through them, but, uh, but I don't think that's necessary. It, at the end of the day, the text controls. Okay, no, I, and I don't dispute your analysis of statutory construction, although I do differ that I think pari materiae is relevant when you're looking at how do you ensure uniformity and consistency and some predictability in the interpretation of the statute. So I, I, am, I am certain that we may disagree on the outcome, but I think we agree the authority of Land Use Commission. I think we agree on what the issue and the question is before Land Use Commission. We may just disagree on the interpretation. So um, I think with that being said, Mr. Chair, I don't have any other questions. And, and so if I just, just okay, may answer that, you know, it was, it was phrased more as a comment. I, I you know, with respect, if, if we did agree on, on the principles of statutory interpretation, and since we both agree that duration is not in the definition, we couldn't agree on the, disagree on the outcome, right? If we agreed on all the principles right. of statutory interpretation, the text is plain, and you and I read the text the same way, then our outcome is the same. I would agree with you. Our outcome should be the same. You're right. It should be the same. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Commissioner Cabral. Uh, thank you all for your information, uh, especially my fellow commissioners, Okuda and Chang. You hit on some of my questions, but I won't be nearly as elegant in my, uh, my questioning. Um, I'm just a lay person here. And so my questions really have to do with, I, I, a whole lot of your presentation, Mr. Chip Chase was, of course, as always elegant, but it really so focused on time frame, and yet I do see it does not appear from my limited reading of 205.45 that the time frame is really relevant, so I can appreciate that. 
but I'm more concerned about the use. And then most recently you referenced something about intent. And so I'm sure that must have some legal meaning, but the use of it is to be a dwelling and a dwelling. I don't know that a, a dwelling is a, a, let me ask you a question. Maybe this will help answer my question. If the residents, the people who are staying, come to stay in this um, property that you are asking for, um, you're petitioning for, the actual property, when they come and stay there, if they were not able to stay there for the three days or the five days or the two weeks that they stay there, where else would they end up staying? Do you, do you have any idea where they'd have to stay? Oh, you know, Commissioner, I, I hate to say that I can't answer the first question you've asked me, but I have no idea. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I have no idea because those those would be extremely specific facts, uh, and, and we don't have okay. those kinds of facts. Before. Okay. Well, because what I'm trying to say is, I think when we look at a farm dwelling, uh, first off, it's a dwelling, which means usually a person dwells in it, meaning they live in it. The people that come to use it on a short-term basis that were that you're you're asking permission that they be allowed to do it, although time doesn't matter. They actually live somewhere else. Uh, is that correct? They don't move in for the three days to two weeks. So dwelling wise, like whether it's I mean, guess they could stay a long time. So it's not the time frame. It's the fact that they dwell there or they don't dwell there. Okay. So I just have a question. My concern is you, 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 all your references on time, but it's actual, my concern is usage. So one, they really don't dwell there. And the second one would be, at no point have I seen anything in your presentation that would represent that they had any type of activity that would be related to agriculture or farm. It's a farm dwelling and they would derive or do something that had to do with a farm activity. And, and at no point did I see anything in your presentation that would say there was any kind of farm activity and their usage of that dwelling. Am I missing something? Uh, it, it, with respect, yes, and, and, but not what you're asking me. What you're asking me is correct, but what I think I've, I didn't do a good job of communicating to you in my papers or uh, in my presentation is that those kinds of specific questions is a particular property a farm dwelling are not before the commission, right? This is not a petition asking, asking uh, uh, to allow X use on X property. This is a petition asking the LUC to interpret the law as a certain date. And the reason that we focused on that date, June 5th, 1976, and the reason we focused on 31 days is because that's the county code. So read literally, and again, the county and OP hedged on it a number of times today, but read literally, a, a, the, the county would define a short-term rental as a farmer, a tenant farmer, on a farm, using the dwelling in connection with the farm and deriving income from the farm, if that tenant is on a month-to-month -month lease. So he's on a month-to-month -month lease, the, the county literally in its definition would say that is an unlawful use of agricultural land. That is why we focus so much on the duration because the county focuses on the duration. The county definition does not consider the things that you talked about. Is there actual farming going on? How are they using it? Where do they actually live? The county definition didn't talk about any of those things when it defined short-term vacation rentals. And since we are here in the construct of the county definition, we don't look at those things. We don't talk about those things. They aren't part of my presentation or anyone's presentation or the facts before this body. All we're looking at is the county law. What are its elements of short-term uh, vacation rental? And, and do those elements duplicate state law as it existed on June 5th, 1976? That's really the only question before this body. And that's why we focused so much on it. The, the things that you're talking about really go to enforcement of a particular use. A particular use might be unlawful, but that illegality has nothing to do with how long a person is living there. A tenant farmer on a month to month is a perfectly lawful use of state land. Another use that may be a 10 year use could be a perfectly unlawful use of state land. The time frame wouldn't matter. And that's really 
the only question that is up before you is on June 5th, 1976, did the duration matter? And, and in my view, the answer is no. Okay, so you're really sort of saying that you understand you're the petitioner and asking for us to, to say that it's okay, you know that what they're doing is not allowed under the law for farm dwellings, but you're saying it's okay because other people have done it and that because it, it doesn't matter whether it's they're there for five days or, or five years, it's okay even though you, you know that it doesn't, it doesn't comply, but you want us then to give you permission to have that be allowed? Not at all. That's I've, what done, I've done a terrible job, Commissioner. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, remember? I'm very... No, no. And so I appreciate this colloquy and ultimately it's, it's my fault. I've done a terrible job because that's not at all what I'm saying. Uh, that's not what I'm saying in, in the least. Um, I, I, you know, is a matter of, of candor. I have no idea how these particular properties are used. I don't know because that doesn't matter. I'm not asking you to bless any particular use. I'm not asking you to say any use on a particular property is okay. I'm certainly not asking you to say because this guy does it, tell me I can do it. N none of that is, is why I'm here, what our petitions are about. Our petitions are only about the county deciding that you can't rent agricultural land for less than 31 days. That's it. The county has decided you can't rent an agricultural property for less than 31 days. The county could do that going forward from today forward, but what it's done is to say, you can't rent it for 31 days today backwards. And so we get to the question on June 5th, 1976, what did the state law say? That's the only thing I'm asking the commission to do. I'm not asking the commission to say short-term rentals are okay, a particular use is okay, a particular property is okay. None of that. Only what the law said, plain language of the law on a particular date. And, and you'd mentioned that I'd said intent. True. The intent we're looking at is legislative intent. What did the legislature intend when it adopted the definition of farm dwelling? We get that intent because we can't go and poll the legislatures. And even if we could, it wouldn't matter, right? What they individually thought doesn't matter. When we say intent, we mean the collective intent. And when we talk about the collective intent of a legislature, we look at the plain language of the law. The law tells us what the, what the collective intent of the legislature was. And here in the definition of farm dwelling, the collective intent of the legislature, in my view, was not to impose a minimum rental period. Okay, I can appreciate that might be the case. I, my, my also, I have to say, I would assume that the intent of the legislature and everybody would not, would say that you're not gonna have a hotel operation in, on a farm property. So I guess we just, I'm looking at it for what the usage is as opposed to the time frame. So oh. uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Let me answer that because I think that's a great question, Commissioner. Y you're right. And so what we would do is this. We would say, what is the definition of farm dwelling, right? Farm dwelling says single family dwelling. What is a single family dwelling? It means a unit for one family. So right in the definition, we know the legislature did not authorize hotels. It authorized single family dwellings. As long as they're used in connection with the farm, or the family that occupies them receives income from the farm. So we totally agree on the subject of hotels. It's gotta be a single family home. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Commissioners. We either can have further questions for Mr. Chip Chaser at this time, or as I mentioned before, um, we can decide that it might be beyond our time and perhaps remaining energy and attention to come to a decision on this matter today. In which case we have our July 23rd hearing date available where we could continue these discussions. Gary. Gary Okuda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would make a suggestion that we continue this hearing 
And during the interim, we request that uh, the parties submit proposed findings of fact, conclusions of law, and or their proposed form of decision and order. And I would, and I would also, in addition, uh, oh, and let me clarify that. So no further briefing or explanation would be required because all of that uh, would and should be contained in the proposed findings of fact, conclusions of law, and whatever the form of decision and order that each party uh, submits. Uh, I would also ask that um, uh, that that uh, the parties provide us uh, a copy of uh, HRS 205-4.3, uh, which was in effect on the relevant date uh, that has been discussed in the various filings, or uh, if that was not the specific uh, section, if they could provide us a copy of that. Uh, I'm only requesting that because for whatever reason, my Westlaw subscription, I'm having difficulty getting earlier versions. But that would be my suggestion because then it would allow uh, Commissioner Ohigashi to be able to review the transcript for the portion that he was not present. Um, I, I will also note for the record of these proceedings that um, I did at, um, let me get you the exact time, um, at 1.32 p.m. our administrative officer, Riley Hakoda, successfully forwarded to us the county's exhibits. Um, so we now actually have those in possession, but obviously have not had a full chance to review those as individuals. Um, so there's a suggestion um, from Commissioner Okuda. I just wanna sort of, before we take any action or move, I move as the chair to defer, wanna just sort of temperature check on where we're at. Commissioner Cabral, are you waving your hand, raising your hand? No. Chair. Ohigashi. Commissioner um, Ohigashi and then Wong. Yeah, I would, I would appreciate additional time, but I'm unlike Gary or Commissioner Okuda, I don't think, you, I think you have to remain, you have to have the hearing remain open and the parties may file some explanation or additional documents or additional briefing that they feel may be necessary to support their proposed findings. I, you know, I, I'm not sure whether or not the Hawaii County will do so, but I'm, I'm kind of confident that Mr. Chip Chase would probably do so and, um, and would like that opportunity. In addition, I think that if you're gonna have the hearing continued, which I would appreciate, uh, that perhaps we cannot foreclose public witnesses from filing additional positions or statements or documents. So I, I, I'm kind of hesitant in trying to limit any additional filings. Commissioner Ohigashi, um, if, I, if I may just, I really appreciate your comments. I just wanna cl clarify one word that you used. Um, you asked for the hearing to continue, but really under the DR procedures, we're not yet in a hearing, right? Right. I, I mean, I'm asking for the proceeding to continue. Thank you. I just want to clarify that small bit of your excellent commentary. Commissioners, we're, we're in a discussion about how to proceed. Uh, Chair. Commissioner Wong. So I totally agree kind of scared with Commissioner Ohigashi and Commissioner Okuda. Um, but the only thing I would like to know is uh, when we continue this hearing, we get to ask more questions after we get additional information? That would be correct. Okay, so I, I, I agree with both commissioners. Okay. I'm, and I'm not, you know, the, the, again, procedurally, commissioners, we could accept one of the petitions and deny the other 
though they're consolidated, but basically make a ruling on it. Um, we could um, schedule it for a hearing or we can simply continue the discussion um, going forward are our options um, for our July 23rd agenda. Commissioner Chang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am, because this is a legal question and it's not a factual question, um, I am less inclined to have findings of fact, um, but I would, I mean, I would like to hear, I would like Office of Planning. Um, they're not a party or petitioner, but I would like them to weigh into, I mean, I think there were a lot of issues that were raised in our discussion today that are legal issues. So I, I guess I'm not inclined, well, I'd like to eat, leave open briefing and not foreclose, um, yeah, not to foreclose that opportunity. Because again, to me, this is, this is a legal question. It's not a factual one. So I'd like to hear what the parties from both the county, Mr. Chip Chase and Ms. Apuna representing OP. Um, I think we raised some issues today and I would like to see some additional briefing. That's just my, that's just my inclination. Yeah, no, this is, this is helpful to have the inclination of the commissioners. Um, Commissioner Axon, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I, I fully agree with the, uh, the commissioners on uh, continuing these proceedings, but I kind of uh, hesitate on trying to get the findings of facts. Uh, as you know, this is not uh, a hearing. This is not a hearing yet. We just got a discussion. All the discussions that we, we had is not really facts. Uh, it's more of there's a, a lot of... Uh, uh, disagreement on the facts. So, uh, although I agree with uh, uh, continuing these proceedings, uh, like uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Chang, uh, I'm kind of hesitant to ask the uh, parties to uh, provide findings of facts, conclusions of law. Commissioner Kuda, do you want to respond since there's been a number of responses to your suggestion? Yeah, thank you. Um, I didn't mean to say that uh, we would actually adopt all findings of fact or some findings of fact. Uh, I just wanted to use that as a framework for the parties to present to us if they thought there were facts, what the facts are, uh, you know, in, in some type of form. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm not at all suggesting that in the end we have to issue findings of fact. Uh, it's basically to have them present to us uh, the form of what they believe the decision should be in the end and uh, the supporting, our, the supporting um, materials. And when, when I say materials, either the legal standards or if they believe there are certain factual statements, like for example, a factual statement is this is what the county ordinance states, uh, you know, things, things like that. So I, I don't mean to suggest that we're engaged in an evidentiary uh, type of determination. Uh, so I'm using those terms kind of broadly. It's basically present us what they believe the Land Use Commission should issue out in the end if uh, each party you know, so prevailed, and then we can sort through that, and uh, hopefully that will help narrow what we have to look at. Okay. Yeah. Anything further, commissioners or staff to the commission? If not, I'm going to um, just one thing, Commissioner Wong. Um, just one thing, I wanted to state that I believe Commissioner Giovanni will be available on the date, so we may want to just ask the staff to cue him in. Yes. So um, if there's nothing further, commissioners, it's my assessment um, based on our discussion and based due to the procedural issues that we're facing with the participation of commissioners Ohigashi as well as Giovanni 
that we are not ready to consider formal, delib formal deliberations on these two DRs that have been combined into a single proceeding, but rather we should continue um, our discussions on this matter um, to what is tentatively going to be our July 23rd hearing. That hearing will be noticed in the normal way by notifications of the parties. We're not giving any specific directions to either the County of Hawaii, to Mr. Chip Chase and his clients, or to the Office of Planning on what they may brief on because the matter continues to be open. Um, you may continue to brief as you see fit in this matter. With that said, I would encourage, especially given the late filing by the county, it would be of great service to the commission that if we indeed meet on July 23rd on this matter, that briefs be delivered to us by July 9th. Does that work for the county and um, for the Rose Hill um, petitioners? It yeah, that's fine. That's fine. County of Hawaii, John Mukai. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mukai. And, Richard, and do you need a motion on this one? or I don't believe I need a motion. Okay. Commissioner Axon. Commissioner Axon. All right, Commi ex Mr. Chip Chase, excuse me. No, not at all, Chair. I was just going to confirm that, that the schedule is fine and, and uh, I am available on July 23rd. Okay. Um, thank you for that. With that all being said, I declare this meeting in recess until it is appropriately agended as previously discussed.